Okay, good evening everybody. It's uh, 6.30, so uh, welcome to this evening's Cabinet meeting. Uh, if I can start by uh, reading out the notice on filming at meetings. Uh, please note that this meeting may be filmed or recorded by the Council for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting using any communication method. Although we ask members of the public recording, filming or reporting on the meeting not to include the public seating areas, members of the public attending the meeting should be aware that we cannot guarantee that they will not be filmed or recorded by others attending the meeting. Members of the public participating in the meeting, e.g. making deputations, asking questions, making oral protests, should be aware that they are likely to be filmed, recorded or reported on. By entering the meeting room and using the public seating area, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings. The chair of the meeting has the discretion to terminate or suspend filming or recording if, in their opinion, continuation of the filming, recording or reporting would disrupt or prejudice the proceedings, infringe the rights of any individual or may lead to a breach of a legal obligation by the Council. Thank you for that. Uh, item two, uh, apologies for absence. Oh, Chair, we have apologies for lateness from Councillor Goldberg. Okay, item three, uh, we don't have any items of urgent business. Uh, item four is declarations of interest. Can I ask any cabinet member if you need to make a declaration? No declarations. Okay, item five is notice of intention to conduct business in private. Chair, we have received one representation from a member of the public objecting to any part of the meeting being held in private on the basis that council taxpayers should have full access to all aspects of the preferred bidder for the proposed Haringey development vehicle. This is at item 23. On considering this objection, the Cabinet need to be satisfied that the material remains exempt from publication for the reasons given on the agenda at item 22, i.e. that it contains information relating to the financial or business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding that information, and also that it contains information in respect of which a claim to legal pr professional privilege could be maintained in legal proceedings and also that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the exempt information. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that's an opportune time just to say to everybody in the meeting that it's really important that we conduct these meetings in the spirit of respect. And when council officers speak, I don't expect any heckling at all. In fact, I don't expect heckling in a public meeting. It's not fair. Uh, cabinet members, uh, you've heard the information from the officer as Cabinet members, are we content that the exempt information in item 23 complies with paragraph 3 and 5, part 1, schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, as outlined by the committee clerk, and that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the exempt information? Do you agree with that? Thank you. Okay, given the connection between agenda items 8 and 10 and the deputation received in relation to item 10, what I propose we do is that we take, uh, we vary the agenda, that we take the deputation first, that we then proceed to consider items 8 and 10 thereafter. We've also received a deputation from the Friends of Reading and Education group in relation to the medium-term financial strategy report, which is at item 11. What we'll do is we'll consider this deputation before considering item 11, but after we have considered all open aspects of the HDV report. For members of the public who haven't attended a Cabinet meeting before, we'll consider the open part of the report on approval of the preferred bidder for the Haringey Development Vehicle at item 10, and we'll take all questions in the open part of the report that do not relate to the exempt information. We will then, as the usual procedure followed for Cabinet, continue to consider the remaining reports on the agenda before going into private session at item 22 to consider the exempt information on approval of a preferred bidder for the Haringey Development Vehicle and also the insurance arrangements for the leasehold right to buy properties in order to consider the recommendations of these reports. The decisions from the meeting will be published on the Council website as usual. Is that all clear and understood, Cabinet? Thank you. So item six, uh, to confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of January as a correct record. Can you agree that they're a correct record of the meeting? Um, there's a
thank you, Jay. Just on page 13, in relation to uh, leasing of Wolves Lane Horticultural Centre, there was an action that I'd be provided with uh, cost of staff redundancies in writing, and I haven't yet received that, so could I request that that's... Yes, of course. I'll, I'll chase that personally tomorrow. Okay. Um, with that... Uh, matter confirmed. Can we uh, agree the, record, uh, the minutes as a correct record? Thank you. So um, we're going to now move to item nine on the agenda, deputations, uh, qu questions and petitions. Uh, the first deputation this evening is from Paul Burnham of Defend Council Housing in relation to item 10 on the agenda. Mr Burnham, if you want to come forward uh, and take a seat. I know that you've... Yeah, so um, my, you have three minutes to make your deputation, Mr. Burnham, uh, and, then, and then what I'll do is uh, the Cabinet has an opportunity to ask any questions of you, and you may nominate a member of your deputation to uh, take the question. So, are you sharing the speaking? Is that... That's fine. So, that's, that's the usual procedure. No problem at all. Okay, Mr. Burnham, well, when you're ready, uh, you have three minutes uh, to uh, speak. Uh, as I said, then we'll ask any questions of you. You're welcome to field questions to your colleagues who have attended with you. I'll then ask Councillor Strickland, as the Cabinet member, to respond to your deputation. And we'll then, as I outlined um, before that, move on to uh, item eight, which is the scrutiny uh, review of the development vehicle, and then item 10, which is the item on the approval of third bidder for the Haringey Development Vehicle. So if that's all clear, whenever you're ready, you have, I'll turn my mic off and you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope, um, colleagues, that you'll be uh, prepared to ask some questions of the people I have with me today. I have Reverend Paul Nicholson, a leading anti-poverty campaigner. I have two uh, people from the Committee of Broadwater Farm Residents Association, and we have Morian from Northumberland Park. And we've all come here today uh, to make represent representations to you, asking, asking you not to set aside the report of the Scrutiny Committee and not to proceed with appointing a preferred bidder for the HDV proposal. This is a huge privatisation or part privatisation scheme. There has been no adequate assessment of the risk that, 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 this, is, that this poses, either of the company going bust or of loss of control over, over the company. In particular, there are no guarantees of the, 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 what the impact will be of the 100% management of the company by the developer will be on the services provided. There are no guarantees that the company would not, that the council would not in future sell its share, sell its share in, in the company. Um, we're also concerned if the project goes right. Many colleagues have said, it, what if it goes wrong? I'm concerned if it goes right, because this is a proposal to demolish thousands of council homes, hundreds of housing association homes, hundreds of temporary accommodation which we need in this borough, and to replace all of that with highly profitable, high-level housing for people who can afford that, that level of housing and with no guarantees, no significant guarantees for, for, for residents. You put forward guarantees, you back down from the guarantees and made all of them conditional um, on what? On the on guaranteeing the profits of the property developers. The two things which seem to be fixed in the, in the, in the demolition plans are demolishing all those estates and guaranteeing the, the profits of the property developer. That's just wrong, and that is what, what really worries us in this, in this document. We're concerned about the democratic deficit. Um, because there's been no public consultation whatsoever on the HDV proposal. We think that's completely inadequate. You haven't put it to full council. You must do that. You must withdraw this proposal. You must, you, you must do a proper consultation on it, and you must take it to, to full council. Going back to the council estates, three of them in the, in the Cabinet report uh, from, uh, from October stated that residents do not want... Uh, redevelopment. And what you're going to do, give them to the, to the HDV to redevelop them. That's completely unacceptable. The uh, colleagues here will tell you what level of knowledge there is, what level of support there is for retaining good council housing in Northumberland Park and Broadwater Farm. So that is, is, really, is really significant. And then we move on to the partner. Uh, um, you know, Councillor uh, Coba described the, seeking the partner as being like seeking a partner in marriage. And look at the partner that we have, honestly, Lend Lease. We have a, a massive multinational company with, quite frankly, a very poor record of, of, of its effect on the social environment, a very poor record 
record regarding workers who choose to be a member of a trade union and take part in it, and look at their record in South London when they did a regeneration scheme very similar to what's proposed in North Tottenham, but smaller. Up, the answer is that with a massive social cleansing scheme, only 5% of the tenants ever returned to that estate. Leaseholders were disposed, uh, disposed of all over London, and the local authority, which was Southwark, didn't even get the money that was promised out of that scheme. So, please think again. Thank you, Mr Burnham. OK, any questions at all from uh, Cabinet members to Mr Burnham's statement? I don't see any questions, so I'm going to ask Councillor Strickland to respond. Uh, thank you to um, Paul and the other residents who have come this evening. Um, if I can just work through your – obviously, you raised a lot of points. If I can just um, work through them uh, one by one. So um, the first has been a concern about um, – not enough assessment of risk. I mean, what I would assure the Cabinet is that, um, you know, this is, of course, this is a big venture. This is a risky venture. Nobody's ever denied that. Um, that's why significant work has gone on to understand that risk, to assess that risk, both from council officers, um, but also independent legal advisers, independent financial advisers, and independent procurement advisers. So we have brought to bear um, lots of different um, bits of advice to make sure that we fully understand this. So, Managing the risk, understanding the risk is an absolutely key part of what we want to do. And in, if you look at the documents um, which are set out how we would approach this, what it makes very clear um, is despite what might be read uh, in the local press leader, um, it is absolutely not the case that um, the council's land um, all um, is given to the vehicle um, on day, when, day one and we hope for the best. Uh, what, what is very, very clear, which is set out in these papers, is that land can only um, be given to the joint company um, if the Cabinet in public, um, agrees a business case for that piece of land. Um, land only goes in bit by bit. So on the Northumberland Park Estate, for example, the land would go in phase by phase. So if the Cabinet was worried about the quality of phase one, we could then say, well, hang on, before phase two, we want to have a serious um, discussion about this. So all manner of things um, in terms of risk. Um, the second key issue uh, you raised was around um, demolitions. Um, and I think it's wrong to suggest that um, the um, development vehicle going forward equals um, you know, demolition, mass demolitions of, of various estates. What's very, very clear is that the, the vehicle is a way of delivering our regeneration plans um, because we can't afford to do that um, ourselves, nor do we have um, hundreds of staff with development expertise um, who can do that. Decisions about demolition, decisions about what happens on certain estates are taken by the Council in partnership with residents. In Northumberland Park, we've been uh, in consultation for some years now with residents. That consultation will continue um, for another couple of years. It's those consultations with residents um, that determine um, what happens on estates, uh, not the council agreeing a particular legal structure to take forward those plans. So these plans are given to the vehicle. Um, so it's wrong to say that cabinet making a decision tonight or in July equals uh, a sort of magic um, decision on a certain estate. That's not true at all. It's also not true um, in terms of the, um, your claim that there are no guarantees, that this is all about creating uh, profitable housing. There are clear guarantees um, in terms of rehousing um, for existing tenants. On top of that, um, we've asked um, that there be more affordable housing and the council would further look to reinvest its own profit from the company into more affordable housing um, and community facilities still. So um, this is not a race uh, for profit. This is not a race um, to, to max out um, really expensive housing, quite, quite the opposite. Um, in terms of a democratic deficit, you said that these issues um, hadn't been discussed. Um, well, I'm afraid so there has been very significant uh, consultation on a number of these issues which will continue. So um, in the key re regeneration areas, Northumberland Park, um, Broadwater Farm, there are ongoing consultations. Now, those consultations have not made decisions because they're not finished. Um, you know, that, that is the fact. Um, there is um, an area action plan for Tottenham, which is with the planning inspector at the moment, where residents were consulted on whether the Northumberland Park estate should be identified um, for estate regeneration. Um, that was agreed and has been sent to the inspector. The site allocations consultation, that was a public consultation, again did the same. The housing strategy talked about um, our ambitions for estate regeneration, and we consulted on the rehousing policy. So the substance of these um, decisions have been consulted on multiple times um, with residents, and this consultation is not finished uh, by any stretch um, of the imagination. 
and it's important to emphasise, as is made clear in the Cabinet report, um, that plans for estates have to be agreed with residents. Um, nothing, nothing about setting up the vehicle changes that um, at all. Um, finally, in terms of um, lend lease, um, you raised issues around um, trade union practice, and I would um, direct you to a, a clear statement on the lend lease website, which does make clear, and we have talked to lend lease about this. Obviously, we were concerned to hear things raised by uh, residents, so we have spoken um, to lend lease about this, um, and they've been very clear that they did uh, purchase um, Bovis, a construction company who had been associated um, with these completely unacceptable practices. Those practices ceased before Lendlease um, purchased this company, um, but Lendlease, um, on behalf of this um, company, had apologised, um, had and, and have settled. Well, I haven't finished, and importantly, have settled all claims made by employees of this former and workers working for this former company. Um, I would say as well that if you look at what Lendlease have done um, in the UK, this is not a company parachuting in to Britain. Um, Lendlease um, built the BBC Scotland headquarters. Um, they, they built the new um, BBC Broadcasting House. They're currently got a contract in Parliament um, to do work there. Um, and in Liverpool, where they did a lot of public sector work, they ran two very successful trade union learning academies. So um, I think it's not quite fair to say um, that Lendlease don't have a good record um, in working uh, with unions or that they've suddenly appeared in the UK. They have a very long and strong record um, of working with the public sector. Um, I think in, in, in the final comment I make, Leader, is simply to say that um, I think it's easy to band around um, a state from South London, um, but that's a completely different agreement. That wasn't a joint venture. It was a completely different arrangement. The financial arrangements were completely different, so that council took a completely different approach to that estate um, versus the one that we're taking here. Um, so, of course, um, we have visited that estate. I have myself wanted to understand what the issues have been there, um, but the approach we're taking here, one takes lessons from that, but two is completely different um, and is not something um, that we want to do. Thank you, Councillor Strickland. Uh, thank you, Mr Burnham, uh, for your deputation. If you'd like to take a seat, you're very welcome to uh, listen to the scrutiny uh, review and Cabinet response to the recommendations, which we're going to move on to now. Uh, item 8, uh, Councillor Ibrahim, uh, as Chair of the Scrutiny Review, if I could ask you to come forward. Uh, good evening, Councillor Ibrahim. If, if you'd like to present the scrutiny review and recommendations for us, please. Okay. Um, I've um, basically. I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I can speak for five minutes, so I'm going to speak to the report. Um, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start by putting some context on the origins and the scope of the Housing and Regeneration Scrutiny Panel's project on the proposed Haringey Development Vehicle. As part of the annual overview and scrutiny work and planning process, it was felt by officers and the panel that we could add value if we conducted a project and provided recommendations on governance arrangements. It was felt that this was an area that there was much work to be done and we could add value as a panel. However, during the process, it became crystal clear for the panel that actually you cannot analyse and make recommendations about the governance structures of the proposal in a vacuum. In saying this, I mean that we could not ignore the overarching question marks which were coming forward on the huge risks of embarking on a scheme with, with such a scale and with such uncertainties about the financial arrangements to ignore the potential risks of a scheme that the governance arrangements are intended to mitigate felt eventually to be counterintuitive. This is particularly pertinent for the panel whose role is um, primarily to carry out oversight and to present critical though constructive challenge to decision makers. 
So um, tight governance, we felt, does mitigate against risks for the public sector. However, in a partnership which is equal, there are concerns about how we could enforce these, simply because we would be in a position of negotiation rather than ultimate decision-making roles, which we currently hold in terms of our, um, 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 the land that we own. The overarching questions that still remain do not mean that as a panel we should not have made governance recommendations. As the Chair, I strongly believe that if the critique of the proposed HDV rests largely on risk and mitigation, it would have been irresponsible of the panel not to recommend protections if the proposal does go ahead. We will be continuing our work on the, on the Haringey Development Vehicle and we have agreed that the parameters of both the pan, at both the panel meetings and the um, overarching um, overview and scrutiny committee. For us, the overwhelming lesson of this project is that many of the answers to the questions we posed to officers and other authorities came back with answers that simply left us with more and new questions. Lots of... Um, lots of our questions have arisen around uncertainties, um, sorry, around certainties, guarantees and commitments that the Council can or cannot deliver at this stage. Ultimately, the panel felt that we need to always consider our primary function and our aim and the purpose of what we do. Often this is about providing certainty and security to vulnerable families who have faced years of temporary accommodation and uncertainty. So asking for certainty and asking for some guarantees, whilst we do as a panel want to exp explore whether those certainties can be provided, we felt that they're an important part of this process. We, we, we do as a panel need to have a role in scrutinising whether everything the Council does does overall contribute to our primary function and on the HDV the panel felt and found that there were lots of questions still to be answered. That's not to make an argument either way but we still feel that as a panel there is lots more work to be done so that we can be assured of, of this process. The panel and the main committee was unanimous in its view that the prudent course of action was that the process be stopped, allowing further and necessary scrutiny. We have made recommendations on, on governments, and you'll find those in the report. These are particularly around potential conflicts of interest, how um, we protect um, councillors and council officers when essentially making decisions as part of a, what would become a, a separate body to the council. Council. We also felt that there were lots of questions around what the financial arrangements would be and how we, how we could protect and, and ultimately um, deliver our, our, our fiduciary responsibility to the Council on where those responsibilities lie. So particularly with something like a Board of Directors, ultimately we, we know that um, anybody who sits on that board, who, um, that there would be an issue around whether their primary function would be to protect the interests of the Council or to protect the interests of the, of the, of the company. And obviously that there, there are responsibilities that, that lie in both. And these are questions that we want to explore more. Um, we ultimately feel that um, because it's, um, a, a lot of our scrutiny work has been quite later on in, in, in the process of, of when the original decision was to go out to procurement, we felt that it was important that we did do something which would add value to the process. But ultimately, lots of questions have arisen as a result, which we feel as a panel still need to be answered. Thanks for that, Councillor Ibrahim. Uh, Councillor Strickland, can I ask you to respond to Councillor Ibrahim's presentation and uh, put forward the Cabinet response to the recommendations. Uh, thank you very much, Leader, and thank you, Councillor Ibrahim, uh, for speaking tonight and also for um, all of the hard work. I know you worked on this um, over many months and had many hours of discussions um, on governance um, and the associated issues. Um, just to pick up some of the particular points that you raised before I come back to the um, report itself. Um, so you raised issues around um, you know, enforcement and how the Council can be reassured that it can actually uh, get what it wants out of this. And I think that's obviously a, you know, a really um, critical question. Um, 
I think what's important to mention um, is the fact that because it is a 50-50 um, joint venture, um, that means that the board can only move forward on the basis of consensus. So, you know, the, the partner um, cannot force the council to do anything. So, um, in the event of a, a standoff, um, we can simply say, well, no, we're not happy with that. So, um, the council can't be forced to do anything. And that is a very powerful block um, and a very powerful way of saying stop um, if, if something is suggested that, we, that isn't in line with what we expect. Um, the... Second issue, in terms of your, you made a number of um, points that were quite correct, Councillor, in terms of um, issues to still be resolved. Now, um, in your report, you did call for, um, you know, the process to be stopped and for a six-month delay to be instigated. Now, um, as you would have seen in the Cabinet papers, um, while we've um, recommended accepting um, 12, um, 12 of the proposals, partially accepting another four, um, one of the recommendations that we didn't accept was the call for a six-month delay. Um, and let me just explain why, because this is very important. So we absolutely agree with you um, that there are still lots of questions um, to be asked and answers um, to be gained. We also agree that that will take a period of some months. Um, and that's why um, set out in the November 2015 Cabinet report, um, which is what would happen if Cabinet says yes this evening, what's also, al always been set out in those Cabinet reports is there would be a five-month delay, essentially, um, from this evening um, until uh, the summer, um, where exactly that would happen, um, where um, the council, with its preferred bidder, would say, right, um, now that you've been appointed as the preferred bidder, we need to really get down into much more detail about governance, about risk management, about um, the board and how that works, around how we properly involve councillors, how we properly involve um, residents. Um, all of that does need to be thrashed out, um, and it absolutely um, will be. Um, what I would say, though, is that... Um, the recommendation here, which is to sort of stop the process and, and not have this on the agenda tonight, um, actually prevents us from getting answers to those questions. Um, because if we said to people, we're not appointing a preferred bidder, we're just going to stop, it's then very difficult for the council to have those much more detailed conversations. It's very difficult for us to then push companies um, who have got no idea or not whether they're the preferred bidder to say, right, we want you know, hard guarantees on tenancies and other issues. Um, to, coming to the tenancies point and the families point which you made, of course, this is a, just want to reassure you and residents that this is obviously a key concern for us. You know, we would not be doing this unless we felt we could get what we wanted in terms of new homes, what we wanted in terms of replacement affordable housing, and what we wanted um, in terms of a good deal for tenants. Um, so we have made clear commitments and that the task um, in the next five-month period is to go into those um, hard discussions and make sure that we can secure um, what we want. That's why tonight Cabinet is only agreeing to appoint a preferred bidder. We're not agreeing to set up the company because we need to know around this table whether or not we can get those assurances um, before um, it comes back to Cabinet. Um, and um, just to pick up your um, conflict of interest point, again, I think this is a, um, you know, an, imp an important governance point, um, but also important to say that this is something that you know, the council uh, lawyers and others and, and councillors themselves are very familiar with. Um, I know this from when I was the vice chair of the Alexandra Palace Board, um, which, of course, is wholly owned by the council, but then has a trading company, um, other subsidiaries. Uh, councillors do sit on boards where they are company directors. They do sit on boards where they're charity trustees. Um, and certainly as a councillor, I've sat on boards where I was both a charity trustee, gone by charity law and a company director governed by company law. So, you know, these complex issues around conflict of interest are, are a day-to-day -day part um, of councillors' jobs. And um, that doesn't mean it will be easy, but I think we are used to managing that. But you're right um, that that absolutely has to be um, looked at. Um, the final thing I would say, just in terms of the risk points um, that you mentioned, you know, is just to emphasise again that um, when councillors go to the board, um, th you know, it's not a free-for-all. They, they, no, they can't do what they want. The company can't go rogue and, and, and do what it wants. Uh, the company can only act uh, within the parameters set by uh, the business plan for the company, and that business plan can only be set um, by this cabinet. Um, so that the council does retain um, significant democratic control. And if that board, um, for good reason, wants to say, well, actually, hang on, this plan isn't right anymore, things have changed, or we've got some new ideas, or resident consultation has thrown up um, a really good plan, um, then any major change to the business case would again have to come back to this cabinet um, for agreement. Um, so I hope that covers the, um, the point you raised um, in terms of those protections. Um, in summary, I just wanted to um, thank you for your report. Um, obviously, Ray, show you, as you would have seen, that we're accepting the vast bulk um, of the recommendations that you made, which are very helpful, and that while we can't accept um, the recommendation around a delay, that is simply because there's already a delay, um, and that delay is designed to look at exactly the questions um, that you've helpfully um, articulated here. So um, can I thank you again on behalf of the Cabinet um, for all of your work, for getting into the intricacies of this. Um, we very much appreciate it. 
Okay. Um, now an opportunity. Uh, some councillors have indicated that they have questions, and I just want to check that councillors have questions on the scrutiny uh, review report. So we're considering just item eight here. Uh, but I've got, um, providing all these people still want to ask a question, Councillor Engert, followed by Councillor Berryman, Councillor Brabazon, Councillor McNamara, and Councillor Edgeful. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to ask what consultation has been undertaken with businesses, tenants, and leaseholders regarding the specific HGV. I think you probably answered part of that. Um, but I'm particularly concerned with the, co with the commercial portfolio, which will be handed on uh, on day one. We did ask at scrutiny to be provided with evidence of consultation with businesses. Um, we haven't received it. We've received nothing on that. So I want to know what's been undertaken with businesses, um, a lot of which are run by um, ethnic minorities because they're within the states. Um, so I think it's particularly important. Um, and the second question I have is I sat on the scrutiny panel which agreed the HDV should be halted till there was more information and then be subject to a vote, a full, a full council meeting, um, so that all councillors can have a say. I wonder why you've rejected this. Thanks, Councillor Engert. Councillor Strickland. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Engert. Um, so, um, in terms of um, tenants and businesses, tenants and businesses um, who were affected, so all of the businesses and people affected uh, by Phase 1 um, were written to. Um, that, you know, we've been very transparent about um, what's being planned. And I should say that when we did write to businesses, which was some time ago, um, you know, very few businesses came back um, asking questions. So, you know, concerns were not raised by businesses, um, even though we did write to them, or we did set out, we did set out very clearly um, what was being proposed. Um, in terms of consultation, um, as I say, um, businesses um, have been informed, and we didn't get any significant feedback. Um, tenants have also been informed. Um, this, has been, this has been put into, um, for example, in Northumberland Park. It has gone into Tottenham Regeneration literature and newsletters to residents. Um, it has gone into um, certainly documents that I've seen in meetings that I've been at. Um, so it has been discussed with residents. But as I would say, the main decisions um, on uh, things like the Northumberland Park Estate are the regeneration decisions about what to do. Um, the, the development vehicle is simply going to be you know, given those plans and told to get on with it. Um, so the main decisions for residents are what do you want to see, do you think there should be regeneration, if you do, what should it look like? And that absolutely, um, as I mentioned, is a very, very significant um, consultation. Um, on the business point particularly, um, what's important to say is that you know, nothing changes from day one. Um, their landlord changes, but you know um, these, cla these but cla cla claims that people have been fond of posting on Twitter and in the papers that from you know on day one rock, you know rent skyrocket and everything changes. Um, absolutely not true at all. Um, any rent policy for the um, joint company, of course, has to be agreed by the whole board. That includes 50% um, of those uh, board members being from the council. So we would never agree to a rent policy we felt was unreasonable. Um, and of course, rents will be reviewed in the normal way when um, rents, um, when the lease um, was up um, for renewal. Um, what's important to say about um, the work of the vehicle um, on the commercial portfolio um, is firstly that it does not, uh, contrary again to things that have been circulated, um, it does not include any of the community uh, buildings um, that corporate property um, have. Um, that's absolutely um, vital. Um, but also, as I say, um, you know, there is very strong protection um, because of involvement um, from the council. And um, what, what the development vehicle will be tasked with doing um, is actually about looking at the industrial estates that we have, where we have, we have widely acknowledged and publicly acknowledged that we do not manage a lot of those estates well. Um, council Goldberg's growth strategy set out very clearly why those estates need to be modernized, um, need to have the jobs intensified. So this is not about um, throwing anybody out or getting rid of jobs. It's actually about getting more jobs um, and getting um, higher skilled jobs. That's what they will be tasked with doing on the industrial estates, um, and that's absolutely vital. Um, in terms of your final question, Councillor, um, in terms of full council, um, you know, what this is a decision for Cabinet, and obviously um, decisions are rooted according to advice um, from officers on where um, decisions should legally be taken. And it's also important to stress tonight that we're simply appointing preferred bidders so that we can start that um, longer negotiation. You know, the, the Cabinet is not tonight uh, meeting to set up the, the development vehicle. 
Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Brabazon. Um, I've come here because I'm a member of the scrutiny panel. I have spent several months myself as a member of the committee, but also doing extensive reading and research around these vehicles. Um, I just want to preface what I want to say with a few uh, small remarks, if I might. Councillor Brabazon, I've got a lot of councillors this yes, evening. Yes, I know always you do. clear that yes. there's an opportunity for you to ask I've got questions. My questions. So, uh, so rather than prefacing your remarks, can we just yeah. ask you to ask I will questions? say this is the most serious and far-reaching decision this council is ever likely to take. And there are, there are therefore, Councillor Coba, there's only one sentence. There are therefore implications for every resident and taxpayer for decades ahead. And our, our report has illustrated that this is unprecedented and appears to be the largest scheme of its type. It's therefore incumbent on us to have raised issues about risk and risk assessment. So I won't take up much more of your time except to say that the council itself is in a very serious financial situation which would, su which would suggest that it can't be assumed. I've read the reports very carefully and both reports, our own report, the scrutiny report and the report for the HDV, and it is peppered with references to risk, but overall gives a very what you might call sunny version that things are going to be fine. So what I'd like to ask in relation to our own work as a scrutiny panel is if a risk assessment was done prior to our scrutiny committee sitting, why we weren't able to see it, number one. Number two, if risk assessment has now been undertaken, can we have an assurance that this can be provided to the committee and published so it can be read widely and by the public? And if the risk assessment is yet to be undertaken, when will this be completed and provided to our committee? It is absolutely vital that a full and comprehensive risk assessment, not a risk register checklist, but a full risk assessment of the financial consequences if things go wrong, as Paul Burnham said, for the HDV is made. And as part of a public and proper scrutiny, I'm asking you will, you, will you confirm and assure that we will be provided with a full and comprehensive risk assessment which works backwards from the worst eventualities? Thank you. Councillor Strickland. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Brabazon, for your uh, questions. Um, so let me start off, and then I'll bring in the Assistant Director, who's been doing a lot of very detailed work on this, uh, which I hope will give you further reassurance. So um, firstly, I think it's important to say that we, everybody around this table accepts that this is a big decision. Um, this does come um, with significant risk, and that's why um, this has been a very long um, and very thorough uh, process. This is why it's been to Cabinet already. I think this is the third time, if I remember rightly, um, it's been to Cabinet. So this would have been to Cabinet um, at least four or five times before we um, actually start this. So a lot of work has gone into this. Um, you would have seen, because uh, I know you've read it, because you asked me questions about it, um, the business case that went to Cabinet um, in November 2015. That set out um, six different options, um, talked about the pros and cons of each, talked about um, the risks associated with each. And throughout this process, as I mentioned earlier, Councillor, um, external advisors have been working with us to go through in, you know, with a fine tooth comb, um, the procurement risks, um, the financial risks, um, the legal risks. And I know from conversations that has involved detailed scenario planning of well, what happens if this happened and what happens if this happened? You know, really trying to work out, um, you know, all of those scenarios. Um, in particular, what happens um, if the property market changes? Because, of course, uh, development by anybody um, is risky. Um, but also, as you say, you know, what happens if you know, the partnership doesn't work out? You know, if, if, we, if we can't agree with them. And there are clear provisions for that. Um, but I wonder, Leader, if I could bring in the Assistant Director, who's really been doing a lot of detailed work on this, and I think we'll be able to add uh, you know, reassurance in terms of exactly what has gone on and how this has been built into the process. So the, um, the, the, the risk assessment for the, uh, the risks to which the Council uh, will be or may be exposed um, in respect to the HDV forms the basis of 
the legal documentation which we've been negotiating with the bidders and will continue to be discussing with the preferred bidder up to uh, the proposal to uh, close the deal which we expect in the summer of this year. Um, the, is the, the specific issue with making that document available is that because it's part of the procurement process, um, to make it publicly available would uh, jeopardize that procurement process. But we have throughout the, uh, we have throughout the scrutiny process, and, and this remains the case uh, now, always been open to discussing both what the risks are and how we're proposing to deal with them uh, with members. Um, and I, I guess the other critical point to say is that when the time comes to uh, that a recommendation, if and when a recommendation is made to Cabinet to establish the development vehicle, uh, which is expected in the summer of this year, uh, those agreements uh, which set out both, uh, which set out the, the kind of legal framework on, the, on how the vehicle would be established um, will be part of that agreement subject to the transparent uh, decision making of the Cabinet in the normal way. So the... the Can I just make clear, as I made clear at the outset of the meeting, Heckling is not something that's tolerated in this chamber, but if people insist on doing it, the one thing I will not have is council officers, public servants heckled. There's one thing to heckle me as a politician, but it's quite another to heckle and interrupt a council officer. I'd ask the officer to continue and complete his comments if they're complete. Okay, thank you for those uh, responses. Next councillor I have is Councillor McNamara. Is Councillor Mac oh, yeah, we're here. Thank you, Leader. Um, my question is, is very uh, straightforward and, and specific. Um, recommendation one of the Housing and Regeneration Scrutiny Panel report outlines a case for delay in proceeding further at this stage with the HTV and for more scrutiny work to take place. It also outlines the nature of some of the risks uh, the panel considered as being the most significant, including the risk of a Cabinet decision being judicially reviewable. Having attended a public meeting last night, reference was made by a speaker to them pursuing action against the Council in the High Court and that they would be issuing the Council with a letter before action. Can you confirm if such a letter before action has been submitted to the Council? If so, how will the Council be responding? What with the risk as predicted in the ONS report now possibly emerging and even before the Cabinet decides on selecting a preferred bidder tonight? Thank, thanks, Councillor McNamara. I'm going to turn to the uh, Council's uh, uh, monitoring officer to respond to that question. Yes, I can confirm that we have received today a, a pre-action uh, protocol letter which we will be responding to. Uh, there's no reason why uh, the decision can't be taken tonight on the, on the back of a seat of that letter. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, next question, Councillor Edgeful. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have uh, two quite brief questions for Councillor Strickland. Um, firstly, I, I note that he says that 11 of the recommendations are fully accepted and four others are partially accepted. Is that about right? Okay. Um, I'm just querying your explanation um, as to why you could not uh, pause the process as, you as um, was also asked within the scrutiny document. Uh, you suggested that the progress was essential for changes to be delivered um, in the agreement between the council and the potential bidder. Uh, I'd just like to see, ask you how this sits with what's in the document here, page 22, um, section 8.6 where it says that under Regulation 30, um, any further negotiations between the Council and the preferred bidder must not have the effect of materially modifying the essential aspects of the procurement. Uh, how, 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 can you, how, can, how can you be in a position whereby you're trying to negotiate, yet at the same time you're told that you can't negotiate? Council Strickland. Uh, thank you very much. So I think, as I made clear um, in my comments earlier, Count Regifer, um, this is not about negotiating a fresh deal from scratch. This is about negotiating further detail. So things that have already been discussed, um, we need to get further detail and we need to turn discussions um, and pledges into firm commitments that we can move forward on the basis of. That's, um, that's what will happen. And I think I was also clear that 
Um, the reason that um, we didn't support the delay is, one, because there's already a delay um, to allow for these discussions, um, but two, given that the procurement is an objective process with a series of panels who each score different bits of the bid, which are then added up at the end, um, delaying the process doesn't change the fact that somebody won that process. Um, you know, it doesn't make any difference to that at all. And to get the answers that we all want um, and those commitments that we want, um, it makes sense to move into um, the next stage, which is why we're recommending doing so this evening. Okay, uh, thank you for sorry. that uh, response. Councillor Edgeford, did yeah, you... Yeah, there was two, uh, two questions. So, uh, sorry, has he so, not answered your second question? Oh, if you, so it's, just for it's, reference, it's, no, 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 it's fine. I'm just going to say to all councillors this evening, if you're asking questions, can you just ask all of your questions and, because we've got quite a lot to get through, but fine, yep, on this account. Okay, the, the second one was actually a follow-up on the question on the risk register, which was asked before, and actually about how um, councillors you know, ordinary backbench councillors get access to read the risk register and understand some of the risks. One of the, quest one of the response that the officer gave was that the risk register wasn't quite ready but would be within the ultimate documents. As you're, you're well aware, in a number of documents that go to Cabinet, uh, in a number of documents that go to Cabinet, there are um, substantial um, uh, Documents which are, which are not made available to the public, you know, where, where councillors have to um, show a need to know and an opportunity to read them. Can I get a commitment that the risk register itself will be more widely available for councillors to read so that we can understand the risks, even if it's the case that it can't be made commercially available, that councillors are better able to understand these risks? Councillor Strickland. Thank you very much for your question. I was just confirming the Assistant um, Director. Um, so Dan was obviously clear earlier around the, the um, commercial elements here and the confidentiality, but um, so we can certainly um, publish a document that summarises the risks and what's been done um, and what the key issues are. There's no problem with that at all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Carter, um, you had a question on the scrutiny. We're dealing with the scrutiny aspects, yeah? Your question. Um, thank you, Chair. It's a, it's a question about the assets that are going into the balance sheet. It's a very basic question, and I think it's an important one. It's one that I have never understood. Uh, perhaps Councillor Strickland could field this. Um, the assets that are going into the balance sheet, um, it does look to me, on the face of it, that on day one, the Council will suffer a huge um, loss, uh, a capital loss, because the, the, um, the joint venture is to be owned 50-50, but according to my calculations, they're not really calculations, it's an impression, um, is that the development partner will put in much less than 50%. And so if it came to a voluntary liquidation, as has happened with a couple of others of these um, limited liability partnerships, the council would suffer a loss of millions, possibly tens of millions of pounds. I, I hear that um, the capital, perhaps you can answer this, I'd like an answer in pounds, please. Um, the, the capital that the development partner would be putting in is equal to the commercial property portfolio, but the, the council is putting in far more than just the commercial property portfolio. You, do you see what I'm getting at? Thank you. Yes, so I shall... Um try my best, I'm sure Dan will come in. I think what's really important to say is that remember that the housing estates um, that would go um, over time into the development vehicle and the future of housing review sets this out in stark detail um, to the pound, um, you'd be pleased to hear, shows that um, many of our big housing estates actually have a negative um, financial value. Um, because of the... <laughs> so it, it is... An, this is the case across London. Um, you know, very, lar very large estates... Very large estates, very large estates, um, where residents are paying low council rents, estates that often need significant work and significant regeneration, um, are, are not um, worth huge um, amounts of money. So um, I think to challenge the premise of your question, it, it is not the case that the council is transferring a um, hugely valuable piece of land in um, from day one. So um, I think that does um, change the situation. Um, but in terms of the second part of your question, um, it is... It, um, it, it is the case that um, the developer um, partner would be matching um, the council's contributions. But in terms of the, the second, the third bit of your question, in terms of liquidation procedures, maybe Dan can pick that up. So the, the, it's absolutely essential to the 50-50 structure being proposed that the, in answer to your question that the private sector partner will always commit 
equity e equal to what the council's putting in. So I can certainly put your mind at rest that there's no proposal that the, that the matching contribution from the partner would ever be uh, less than the contribution made by the council. That's a fundamental principle on which the whole proposition um, is based. And then that means that the, that the equity contribution that the council has made is 50% is, is and that that, is, that, is then, that would then be reflected in uh, the arrangements that would, that would follow if, the, if and when the vehicle would be wound up. But it's the 50-50 the nature of the deal is absolutely fundamental to the whole structure, and there would never be a suggestion that the equity contribution from the council would not be matched by the private partner. And as if and when the council puts in additional uh, uh, sites beyond the, the, the uh, commercial portfolio, which goes in at the start, then again, the partner would match that with uh, an, uh, an equity contribution equivalent to the value of what the council was putting in. Well, uh, okay. th there isn't a... There isn't a pounds figure now because the valuation, I mean, we have valuations for these sites that are historical, but the valuation that would, that would uh, determine what the contribution from the private sector partner would be will be done at the time of transfer because that's, that's the valuation that matters. And that valuation, of course, it's impossible to predict now. Okay. Uh, Councillor uh, Berriman, I think your question, <coughs> Councillor Carter's question, actually related to item 10. So I'm just going to cover this off, and then if you pick up your question, because I already had you down to ask a question in item 10. So um, at this stage, can I ask Cabinet to note the scrutiny recommendations and agree the Cabinet response, which you'll find at Appendix 2 of the report? Is that agreed? Thank you. So if we could move on to item 10, which is the approval of the preferred bidder for the Haringey development vehicle. Councillor Strickland, is there anything else you wish to say by way of introduction to the report? Um, thank you very much, Leader. So um, we've covered um, a lot of the issues already, which I won't repeat, but just to, um, I think, remind members of um, briefly how we got here and why this is important. Um, it's widely accepted that there is a desperate need um, for housing in this borough, um, and what our strategic housing market assessment shows um, is, there is there is not enough of any type of home. So um, affordable housing for rent, um, shared ownership, um, intermediate rent, intermediate sale, private rented, private sale, there is, there is not enough of any of that. So there is a desperate housing crisis um, in this borough, um, which reflects the absolutely dire housing crisis, um, which is affecting... Mr Dunn, could you stop heckling, please? Thank you. Which... which, which um, is similar across um, all London boroughs facing this enormous crisis. We've always been clear as a Labour Council, and you said very clearly, Leader, um, that we will not manage decline and we will not just sit here and accept a housing crisis. We will not just sit here um, and watch estates crumble. Um, and we will Sorry, Mr Dunn, we, we cannot conduct a meeting if you continue to shout over everybody. So it's your choice, Mr Dunn. You can, you can stay in the meeting... OK, well, if you want to leave the meeting, that's entirely your choice, but we cannot conduct a meeting where one person insists on heckling throughout. Councillor Strickland, can I ask you to continue? Thank you, Leader. Um, and as Councillor Goldberg made clear in his growth strategy, um, we absolutely will not be a council um, who just sits with substandard industrial estates um, with very few jobs um, when we've got unacceptable levels of unemployment. So um, we want to take action um, on all of these things. Um, but the challenge is, um, how do we do this? Because we're trying to deliver big ambitions that have been discussed with residents, which continue to be discussed um, with residents on homes, jobs um, and regeneration in a context where the government has taken £160 million pounds off us. The government um, continues to restrict our ability to spend our own housing money, um, which is completely um, ridiculous um, and which I lobbied the housing minister on um, just a few weeks ago. And actually, when you look across London, what you see, Leader, um, is that in 2015-16, um, the previous financial year, of the 33 London councils, 26 of those councils did not start building a single house, a single council house. So it is not the case that other councils are building, are building tens of thousands of new council homes and Haringey hasn't got round to it. Across London, councils don't have the money, don't have the expertise and don't have the capacity to do this. So we have worked hard um, through the Future of Housing Review um, and through the work on the vehicle to look at how we can get the, um, the homes we need, the jobs we need, the regeneration we want, but crucially at the speed and at the quality um, that residents... Sorry, Mr Dunn... I've now heard you invoke the language of Hitler. I'm not going to continue with this. You talked, you talked, I heard you, Mr Dunn, Mr Dunn, you used the term, you used the term Lebensraum, and I'm not going to have it in this chamber. I'm not going to have it continuing. So this is your final warning. You let Councillor Strickland continue or you leave.
Thank you, thank you, Leader. So, um, so we have worked very hard. Um, I think there have been suggestions the decision has been rushed. I would suggest um, far, uh, far from it uh, and quite the opposite. So a lot of work has been done to look at what are our options in these incredibly difficult times. Um, we have looked um, at wholly owned um, council companies, which I know members have, have been keen on, but as was set out in the Future of Housing Review and in the business case, when you look at the councils in London using wholly owned companies, they're building very few homes. Um, and often they're in areas with much higher land values. Um, we then looked at um, standard development models. Now, there's nothing wrong with those. We're using those ourselves in other areas. But we felt very strongly that in these, on these sites, leader, because we own all of the land on these sites, that we had to take a different approach. Where we're using public land, we need an approach where we can share in those profits to reinvest um, in community facilities um, and affordable housing, but crucially, uh, where we maintain control in the long term. Um, that's why... Um, we alighted on a development vehicle. Um, and it's important just to, in concluding to emphasise that Cabinet first talked about this in February 2015. So this has been going through a slow um, and thorough process. Um, questions and issues have emerged which are incredibly useful. Um, but I remain convinced this is a good approach. Um, the uh, bid from Lendlease um, is a strong one. Um, I think it's right that, that the Cabinet this evening um, appoints Lendlease um, as its preferred bidder. And I think that the concerns raised around um, you know, pinning down the deal for tenants, um, protecting um, communities are absolutely right. Getting the mix of homes and jobs we want is absolutely right. That's what the next five months is for. Um, and I will be working very hard with officers um, and with our external advisers um, to make sure that we do get the best possible deal for our residents and for our communities um, in the next five months. Thank you, Councillor Strickland. So, as set out before, people need to note that the report has exempt information, which will be considered in the private part of the meeting. Now, I want to have all debate, all questions considered uh, in this part, apart from that information which is uh, exempt. Uh, we will consider the recommendations that set out at section 3.1, uh, item 23 of this report. Uh, I've got indications of questions from uh, Councillor Engert, Councillor Brabazon, Councillor Bevan, Councillor Edgefall, Councillor Tucker, Councillor Berryman and Councillor Diakides. I can't see Diakides here yet. So in that order, uh, Councillor Engert first, please. Thank you, Chair. I've got three questions. On page 75, 6.10, bullet 2, I'm just giving you the references, Councillor Strickland, so you know what I'm talking about. The report states the following on the delivery of affordable housing by the HGV. There is not likely to be a net loss of social housing, at least on a room-by-room -room basis across the area as a whole. On page 82, 6. Point one nine, it states there is a presumption that sites delivered by the vehicle will meet council policy and yield 40% overall housing. Can you assure me that in the case of housing estates, where the vast majority of homes are rented to council tenants, there will not be a loss of council homes in favour of other types of affordable homes, such as shared ownership? My second question... My second question on page 86, first bullet. Can you explain how the construction exclusive, exclusivity agreement that guarantees a proportion of construction contracts to Lend-Lease's construction arm will incentivise Lend-Lease to ensure that the Haringey HGV is beneficial to the council? <laughs> and on page 89... Um, 8.5 bullet 4. Similarly, can you explain why Lendlease will be charging for their expertise? I had understood one of the reasons for the HGV was gaining expertise without paying for external consultants. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Enger. So if I take the first question, then the Assistant Director who's been in negotiation on the second two points um, can come in on those. So um, in terms of the um, reprovision of the, uh, the Council housing, we've made very clear 
political commitments, the Leader and I, um, that um, all of those tenanted homes will be reprovided. We have been very clear that they will not be reprovided as council houses because they will be rebuilt um, through the vehicle. Um, that has um, certain advantages um, in terms of um, some of the freedoms from uh, ministerial interference that we've discussed in detail at scrutiny uh, together, Councillor. Um, but also, um, we, within that, and because we're involved as part of the company setting the tenancy policies, um, setting the other arrangements, um, we are comfortable in guaranteeing those tenants' um, lifetime tenancies um, on the same terms. So that's been um, discussed very clearly. And it's important to say that um, the 40% um, that, that is not um, interfered with um, by the 40% um, affordable housing. So I think it has been suggested by some um, that on a council estate that's mainly council tenants, applying the planning policy means you can only 40% of that can keep being um, uh, you know, affordable housing. That's not the case at all because remember, um, on estates like Northumberland Park and some of the other estates, um, we will be building more homes. So the intention would be, um, subject to agreement with residents and detailed master planning, that the affordable housing will be rebuilt, but then as well as that affordable housing, other types of affordable housing will be built as well, um, like shared ownership, but then also homes for sale and homes for private rent will be built as well. So there'll be more homes overall, um, and that's how we can both reprovise um, the existing housing and um, meet our 40% target. Um, it's also um, important to raise that sites like this one don't have any housing on them at all. Um, so, of course, affordable housing that's built here is, a, is pure additional uh, net affordable um, going towards the numbers. And that does allow us across the piece um, to both um, make sure that council tenants get a, um, a comparable home and build new affordable housing um, on top. Um, Dana, can I ask you to answer the questions in terms of the exclusivity agreement detail and the charging arrangements? So, um, uh, in both cases, the kind of the, the, the precise details and, and sums and so on um, associated with uh, those elements of the agreement. Sorry, the, the precise kind of um, sums and commercial arrangements associated with those two elements of the, of the process are still subject to the procurement, so they're not um, uh, in the public domain at the moment. But, the, but what can be said about the principles that underpin them, firstly on construction exclusivity, is that. Um, it will any uh, contract which is subject to that construction exclusivity clause would always be first of all subject to the approval of the HDV board and secondly very carefully benchmarked against the market to make sure that it represents good value in the general construction market at the time that that contract is being let so it has those safeguards and then specifically on the fees point I mean, like any developer and the, and the Harringay development vehicle will be will be a developer like any developer um, before the profits are shared between the two partners fees are paid for the services that are provided and development management fees as well as construction fees and so on are part of that fee arrangement so it, it doesn't reflect anything more than uh, the normal fee structure that would exist in a, in a, in a property development of that kind. Okay, uh, Councillor Brabazon. Uh, Councillor Bevan. Thank you very much. As a councillor for one of the areas involved heavily in this project, Northumberland Park, I felt I had a duty to come to this uh, cabinet. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, the independent leasehold advisors who are working with the tenants on these estates have done surveys and they actually show that the tenants, only 4% of the survey returns show that the tenants have a reasonable knowledge of regeneration and that survey had a response of 37 percent so although the council has done quite a lot of work there there's obviously a lot more to do because the level of knowledge is is very low now I'm aware that when we negotiate over the next five months the council will be seeking to achieve 13 additional question, certainties in this contract and I would like to ask the cabinet member to confirm that these 13 items will be included in the negotiations. Now, obviously, if I read these 13 out, it will take several minutes, so I hope you're okay with that, as I'm the councillor for this ward. I thank, first of all, the opportunity that's going to be given to scrutiny to do some more work. So the things that I'm seeking, and I hope you will be seeking in the coming negotiations are, that a clear com commitment be made to council tenants to be rehoused on rent, matching that of an equivalent council property and on the same terms either on the estate or elsewhere in the borough according to their choice. 
that to protect these homes from future generations of Haringey residents, we will not offer a right to buy on replacement tenanted homes built by the development vehicle. That Haringey board members will work to secure HDV tenancy and eviction policies which protect vulnerable tenants. That overcrowded tenants will be offered a replacement property of a size that meets their needs. That a residence charter setting out the expectations of Northumberland Park residents and written by residents themselves will be adopted by Cabinet to give a clear public commitment of the ambitions of the tenants and leaseholders. That the development vehicle will be bound by Haringey's planning policy requ requiring at least 40% affordable housing and that the Council will seek to use profits from the vehicle to boost affordable housing numbers wherever possible. That we recognise the particular challenges facing resident leaseholders and ensure a support package be developed so that they do not lose out. That resident consultation be guaranteed with a commitment that sites can only be transferred to the HDV once full resident consultation has taken place. That no scheme or transfer of land can take place without Cabinet approving a business plan, setting out expectations for the number and type of homes, jobs and employment space required, need for new open space and community facilities, the timetable for development and an assessment of the key risks and a notice of these decisions be available for councillor discussions through the usual publicity and advance in the forward plan. That the HDV will report regularly to Cabinet on its work and progress towards agreed plans based on clear and robust key performance indicators. That the agreement with the preferred partner should include commitments that the HDV's corporate business plan be presented to overscrew and scrutiny on an annual basis and that senior HDV staff will be available to answer questions at overview and scrutiny as required. That following discussions with ward councillors, a consultative structure will be agreed to make sure that councillors are kept fully informed about proposals in their ward, consulted at an early stage and able to inform the decision-making process. That the five-month negotiation period from February 17 be used to seek commitments from the preferred bidder on all these issues, to discuss proposed governance structures with councillors and undertake a more detailed risk assessment, and that an update on these members will be brought back to councillors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Bevan. Uh, that question certainly had quite a lot of clauses towards the end, but I think Councillor Strickland was noting them down. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Bevan. Um, so, firstly, on um, the question of Northumberland Park. So, um, so, I have read the consultation report you mentioned, not for a little while. Now, my memory, John, uh, to be fair to what the um, independent advisor said, was that it wasn't that 4% of residents knew anything about the um, consultation. It was that 4% of residents said they knew a lot about um, what was happening in regeneration. From memory, another 60 to 70% said they knew about um, the regeneration. Um, so actually, um, if you read the full report, um, I think it's quite a good result. Now, as you say, though, what I, where I completely agree with you is that, of course, you know, there is still a lot of work to be done. I was honest at the beginning, Leader, that there is probably still years of work to go on. Um, in Northumberland Park in terms of further consultation, um, discussing a, and agreeing a master plan um, with residents. That will take um, some time. Um, and you're quite right, we need to work harder at that um, and make sure that we do reach everybody, including um, socially excluded uh, tenants. Um, also want to say that you know, the monthly meetings that I have with you and the other ward councillors have been very helpful for that and obviously look forward to continuing to working with the three of you um, and what I think has been a very healthy partnership to make sure that local um, residents' concerns are fed directly um, to senior staff and, and directly into what we're doing. Um, the, um, third, the second part of your question, um, as I understand it, that they were, it was a, a list of um, commitments that were discussed by the Labour group and your question was, um, will they be taken forward into the negotiation? Um, the answer is yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Strickland. Next question, I have Councillor Edgeful.
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and first, the first question, I'm happy to pass this to, to Alan, uh, Councillor Strickland. I understand that the procurement prospectus makes clear that the Council reserves the right not to make any appointment whatsoever following this procurement process. Uh, can you confirm that this to be the case? And can you also confirm that lend lease are aware that despite being chosen as our preferred bidder, if the Council decides not to proceed with the HDV, the Council can do so at no financial cost to itself? Um, secondly, is a question regarding um, the, again, it's about exclusivity. Can you confirm that once we sign this agreement um, with Lend Lease to Preferred Bidder and we sign the HDV, that the Council is then unable to progress with any development, any other development of any of its sites with anybody else apart from um, the Preferred Bidder, which would be Lend Lease? Uh, and the... And the third question is actually around the, um, again, it's a right of return. The commitment's been made for a right of return for tenants to come back and also suggested there's a right of return for leaseholders to come back. However, one of the things that came out of the Aylesbury Estate Judgment um, in Southwark was that if, as a council, we seek to buy out and compulsory purchase the properties of leaseholders, we need to give them enough money so that they can come back and buy a property on the estate. Can you confirm that's also the case, please? Thanks, Councillor Paul. <laughs> Councillor Strickland, do you want to make a start with those? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Edgefer. Um, right, so, um, in terms of procurement, you're completely right, and we've made this clear, we also made this clear um, when the Cabinet debated um, Hornsey Town Hall. Um, the Cabinet is not obliged to, you know, pick a partner if the, if the Cabinet is not um, happy with where the, the procurement um, has taken us. Um, and you're right to say that there will be no, um, you know, immediate direct cost to us. Um, if, if we decided to pursue that. Of course, there's always a risk of challenge um, and, of course, the, the reputational risk of the Council of having embarked on a multi-year process um, and suddenly changing its mind at the last moment um, obviously um, is something we'd want to consider. Now, if we genuinely weren't happy with what was being proposed, then, of course, the Council and any procurement could say, you know, no thanks, you know, this, this doesn't meet our um, requirements. Um, in terms of exclusivity on the, um, the site put in, um, it is the case that, the, obviously, that the company... Um, um, would, obviously, would be developing them. But, um, you know, as part of that, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, Lend-Lease would have to develop every single thing. Um, you know, it may well be that there are partnerships, um, you know, with other organisations, with housing associations. Um, you know, that's really important to say. Um, and then in, on the leaseholder question is a very important one. Um, you're right to raise the um, Southwark judgment. And this is something um, when we had a meeting of Labour Housing Cabinet members um, with the Housing Planning Minister and the Homelessness Minister, this is about a month ago, and we did explore this with him specifically, and you're quite right in terms of um, what went wrong there, that Southwark were found to have not provided adequate uh, compensation support for leaseholders. Um, now, this is something we're working very hard on. We are committed to offering a, a, you know, a fair deal to leaseholders, as you say quite rightly, Councillor Edgefer, and we have to as well. Um, but if I could just draw on um, the Love Lane Estate example, which obviously is much further ahead um, than this, um, what's been offered to leaseholders there um, is a brand new property on the same estate that's a shared equity property uh, where they transfer the value of their home in and they're not charged um, for any difference um, in that property um, until they eventually sell it. So we've made a very good arrangement on the Love Lane, which leaseholders have been very happy with, um, and we would obviously seek the same arrangement here. One thing, I wasn't quite clear on the response to the, to the middle question, which is about whether or not, as a council, we can develop anything with anybody else, or whether Lend-Lease gets first dibs on everything, on every development within the, count, within the, the borough. No, absolutely. I was just clarifying. Um, so um, on the Category 1 site, which lists in the report, and um, then obviously that they would be done with the vehicle. As I said, the vehicle may well work with other um, organisations, but um, there's no suggestion that because we've got the vehicle um, that council development more widely um, is impacted. That's not the case at all. You know, um, I went to see last week um, tenants who'd moved into the first council house we've got for 20 years, which we're very proud of. Um, you know, we're looking to continue to build homes. As you know, we're working with housing associations to build a further 100 homes in our land. You know, the council will continue to build its own affordable housing, um, and that is not affected by this at all. Okay, uh, Councillor Tucker.
Thank you. May I follow up from the uh, question asked by Councillor Engert regarding uh, perhaps the, the single most important guarantee, which is that the current stock of council-owned homes, um, that is those occupied or potentially available, uh, will be reprovided on the new estates following demolition and rebuilding by the HDV. And I want to close that a bit further. Not just will be provided, will be provided at secure tenancies and target rents. Can we have that minuted as a decision of the Cabinet at this meeting? That's my, my first question. Secondly, in terms of what negotiations with the bidder, uh, the preferred bidder, can achieve, um, Councillor Strickland, um, in answer to the question by Councillor Ejifor um, regarding procurement regulations, uh, said that, yes, we can only negotiate about the detail. So things need to have been pledged or agreed in advance during the procurement process itself by the bidder. We cannot now start asking things that were not pledged or agreed during the procurement process. And therefore, can I ask, was it made clear with Lend-Lease during the bidding process that there will be, as a minimum, an exact reprovision of council homes and that there will be full right of return at target rents and secure tenancies for all current tenants on these estates. My second question. My second question refers to the, uh, the so-called construction exclusivity agreement, whereby work in construction won't be going out for tender nor will it be done, for instance, by the council's in-house staff. So this is a pre-agreed um, private sector agreement whereby Lend-Lease gets exclusive rights to a proportion of the building works. Now I note that it says that there is a value for money element here, but we've had these public-private partnerships for several decades now, and there's been value for money written into those. And the experience has been that these private property developers who are not charities and they're not there for a social purpose, they're there to make profits for their shareholders, they will use the opportunity to rinse the public sector for every penny or every million or every hundred of million dollars. Can, can we have can we, have, can we have a clear guarantee that we are not moving into territory whereby the HDV itself declares no profit or perhaps even a loss and thereby no money accrues to the council? But Lend-Lease are earning tens, hundreds of millions through this exclusivity agreement because they get all the profits from the construction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in answer to your first question, Councillor Tucker, um, I would just repeat what I said earlier. We've been quite clear about commitments um, in terms of tenancies. Um, I'm sure that will appear in the minutes. It's been written down um, in other places uh, many times. Um, in terms of your question around um, a secure tenancy, as I, I would just repeat what, repeat, re, repeat, well, I have answered the question. We've made a very clear commitment, which I've repeated um, again and again this evening. Um, now, but, as I mentioned earlier, again to repeat that, um, this is not a secure council tenancy. Um, we are matching terms. This is a lifetime tenancy, um, and tenancy, uh, tenants will be offered that lifetime security. But this is not a council tenancy on exactly the same um, security, um, as it were. Um, but, as I said, um, that will be matched, and that's been made very clear uh, repeatedly. Um, in terms of a, a decision by Cabinet this evening, the, the Cabinet is deciding this evening to appoint a preferred bidder. We're, we're not deciding tonight um, intricate details of um, tenancy arrangements. That's for the discussion um, that will take place, um, as I've made clear um, throughout the meeting. Um, 
So, in terms of the, um, whether the, the reprovision was included, this is something I was just double checking, but something I did discuss, um, obviously, with staff on a number of occasions. And the financial modelling um, that was used as part of the um, vehicle um, you know, does assume um, reprovision, so that it has been um, taken into account. Um, on the exclusivity agreement, um, the first thing says that the council, you questioned why we weren't using our in house construction staff, or we don't have any. Um, we, we don't have staff who build houses, and that's one of the reasons we're here tonight uh, having this discussion. Um, it's also very important to say that this is very, very far removed um, from a, a PFI deal, a private finance um, initiative deal. Um, you know, this is completely different. Um, but you're quite right um, that, of course, there is always a risk when working with a partner in this sort of situation, and that, that they, of course, will want to maximise their profits, um, and sometimes in ways that we might not uh, want them to. And that, that's why um, the report does make it very clear um, that this has to be subject to um, best value um, discussions. And while that sounds quite woolly, what that means is hard-headed financial discussions um, so that we can be um, assured as a council that our public duty on best value um, is being met. It's also really important to emphasise, again, that um, decisions Decisions about how the organization works, what contracts are let, um, which um, uh, contractors are used for different things, you know, those decisions will be made by the board and half the people on that board are from the council. So it will be very difficult um, for, for the partner um, to start taking sort of major secret decisions about what the vehicle um, was going to do. Um, there will be a lot of transparency um, about this stuff. Um, so in conclusion, um, th this, as the report makes clear, this is something that needs to be further discussed. It's not finally um, settled yet. Um, the questions you raise are very valid ones and will absolutely be included um, in the discussions we have. Okay. Claire, so can, I, can, I, can, I, can I please try and get a no, clear no, no, no. answer to the Councilor first part Tucky, of the question? You've had your, you've had your questions, and Councillor Strickland has answered them. Yeah. Has answered your questions. <laughs> Councillor Berryman, I have next. Oh, Councillor Brabazon, can I just clarify? I thought you'd taken your hand down and didn't want to speak. Yeah. Councillor Berryman next, and then. But you, you can come. So I've got Berryman, Dikides, Blake, and then Brabazon. <laughs> Councillor Carter. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted, now we've named the partner, Len Lease, to clarify in the public domain, because I do get asked this a lot as a ward councillor with, with one of the pieces of land that's going in at the beginning. Um, the, the, partner, the, the main object of the partner is to bring the capital and expertise to help us with our ambitious plans. We've already heard about the expertise. We may have to pay for that, but... On the capital side, what, what I'd like to get a clear answer on is our partner, we've chosen Len Lease, back in 2009 were put on watch by a few credit ratings agencies to be downgraded to junk status. Uh, that wasn't unusual back then. There was a liquidity crisis. There's a financial difficulties. But we're in a world now where the Fed are raising rates. We've had Brexit and so forth. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, and we do know that we will need to get this work done. Once we move people off estates, it's going to be a negative carry trade for us, to use a, the parlance of the markets, because we will be paying to rehouse them. We won't have the income from our commercial portfolio. We won't have the income from our, even our council houses, which are still income-generating assets quite often. So can we get clarified tonight what their skin in the game is, so to speak? Are they really matching our equity stake with cash? Or is it, as is also mentioned in the public domain, other things such as loan notes, which are a kind of an IOU where you, you won't receive the money from the partner until the very end when the, everything's built and there's profit to be had? What, what will Lend-Lease match our equity stake with? Will it be cash to the tune of, say, 48 million to match the commercial portfolio, whatever the value of the, the land in Muswell Hill is. Obviously, I, I do hear that they're saying the Northumberland Park is very valued at negative 15 million, but overall, will they match us with cash? And if not, what will it be? Do we know? Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your question. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, they, it, it would be matched with cash. I've just checked that with the assistant director. Um, in terms of your questions around financial due diligence um, and you know, what checks were done um, on the bidders, can I ask Dan to go through what was done? 
Yes, so the first uh, stage of the procurement process in January last year, we um, uh, all the prospective bidders had to fill in a pre-qualification questionnaire, which had some very clear and quite high thresholds about their um, financial capacity to deal with development on the scale that we anticipate the vehicle doing. And those thresholds weren't set arbitrarily. They were set in order to give us confidence that, that no bidder could get through unless they could show us that they had the financial capacity to, to commit to the project on the scale that we're anticipating. So every bidder who came through to the long list and then the short list was able to demonstrate at that point that they had that capacity. Thank you. So just to clarify, because you did mention earlier... Uh, that we may, they may be matching our state with equity, it will be cash to the value of the land that we put in. So, the, so the, they make a commitment of the cash, and there's a kind of absolutely legally binding commitment to that. What they don't do is necessarily is write a check for that cash on the day that the land transfers, because the, ca the, the, because the vehicle won't need, need that cash, and there's no point in having that cash sitting in the vehicle's bank account uh, not doing anything. So what they will do is either commit cash or, or make a binding guarantee, which is what you referred to as the loan note, to, um, to commit that cash when the vehicle needs it to proceed with development. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Berryman. Next on my list, I've got Councillor Diakides. Your question, please, Councillor Diakides. Thank, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's something that constituents have been asking me, and I'm sure that there are very good explanations, but it would be good to put them in the public domain, and it is in relation to the uh, proposed uh, partner. Lend lease. I'm told that according to press reports, Lend lease has got a, a bit of a checkered history. And some, on some issues, for example, about illegal blacklisting, yeah. th they were done, I understand, they had to pay huge compensation, etc. About uh, defrauding local authorities, I'm told that in America, New York, for example, one example, they were given a record fine, I think, for an American local government for overcharging and other things, the local authority. I'm told, I'm told that in Australia, Victoria government had dis, uh, discontinued a particular ma major contract with them and then tried to ban them from getting any more contracts because of some kind of close practices, etc., etc. And in addition, I'm told that of the Haygate estate here in Southwark, both Lend Lease and the council there were severely criticized for Lend Lease providing all kinds of gifts and hospitalities to key members at the time, including. Uh, subsidizing trips to uh, south of France to MIPIM, including um, oh, right, free tickets to prestigious sports events and so on, etc., and all that kind of thing. And I think this, the, no, the mind, all this might be absolutely above board, but what I'm saying is that there were a lot of criticisms at the time, and I've been shown press, uh, cuttings, etc. about it. My question now is, I'm sure because we got, we paid a lot of money for consultants, etc. to check all that out. I'm sure that those who made the decision were fully aware of those criticisms. And what I would like to know is, what is the answer? What do I tell those persistent constituents of mine to make sure that not only we are above board, but we are seen to be above board. And secondly, I've been asked to ask that question, do any of the members who got involved in the selection process in one way or the other are of those who have been, their position has been compromised by accepting gifts by uh, the... Um, uh, in good faith, no, no, no doubt about it. In good faith, uh, no, no, but accepting, accepting gifts by the lob lobbyists, the lobbyists for land lease. Again, no, again, I think 
uh, if it is the case, then have people declared a proper interest in not participating in the process, or how did they handle it? I'd be really grateful if there are some answers to these questions. Thank you for your questions, Councillor Daikides. As you will know, you were a Cabinet member for some years. At the beginning of every Cabinet meeting, along with any committee meeting, is an opportunity on the agenda for anyone to make a declaration of interest. I can confirm to you, as you arrived late this evening, no such declarations were made. I shall turn to Councillor Strickland for answers to the questions you raised. Thank you very much for your question, so, and We did cover blacklisting as the doors before you arrived, um, but just to run through that again. Um, so, um, of course, we have been concerned by um, things that have been brought to our attention. Um, so on first thing Monday morning, senior officers did meet with senior representatives um, of Lendlease um, who clarified the situation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Lendlease had previously acquired a company um, that was involved um, in blacklisting. Um, that um, involvement had ceased before Lendlease um, made the purchase. Lendlease therefore sort of inherited um, that problem. Um, Lendlease um, has settled um, all of the claims um, that were made and has confirmed to us very strongly um, that it does not condone blacklisting uh, of any sort. I also mentioned earlier, Isidorus, um, that in the northwest, where Lendlease again have been involved very strongly with the public sector, um, Lendlease, in fact, were still online. Um, Lendlease were highlighted um, as a good practice case study um, by UCAT, the union who um, subsequently merged with Unite, as a good practice case study because they were running two uh, union learning centres. Um, for the construction industry. So um, they do have a very strong um, record of work in the trade union movement. And as I understand it from reading some of the articles from the Australian state of Victoria, it was, it was some of the um, right-wing government's rules there that were anti-union and that Lend-Lease um, fell foul of. So I suggest when people Google, um, they read below the headline. Um, I also answered the question earlier, Isidore, on the Hairgate estate, and, and just to reassure you that these two things are completely different. So the Hairgate estate was a sale um, to a developer, um, and lots of the councils in, in, um, along the river um, have a policy um, of maximising um, for sale housing um, in Zone 1 so that they can then plough the huge amounts of money you get from that um, into affordable housing um, in cheaper bits of their boroughs. We do not have such a policy. We're a very different um, borough, but equally we're not entering into a development agreement um, with Lendlease. We're entering into a, a partnership, a joint venture, uh, which is completely different. So where Southwark Council had basically no control over that development once they'd sold the land, um, we have significant um, control here. Um, and just to add to what the leader said, um, in terms of declarations, um, all hospitality is declared on the Council's website and is therefore um, all to see. Um, it's also important to, to say that um, members of the Cabinet um, and councillors are not directly involved um, in the selection process um, for bidders. So there's a, in, in accordance with very strict and onerous EU rules, um, there's a series of panels looking at different bits of the bids with different officers, um, different independent advisers. Um, they all, over the at the end of the competitive dialogue process, they add up the scores for each section, and whoever gets the most points after this onerous process is the winner. So it is a very dry, very objective process, um, and officers came to me in the leader and said, this is who's won. You know, we have no uh, involvement at all um, in picking who that is. Our job is to be assured that that process has produced um, a good bid. Just, no, just, no, sorry, Councillor Dyke. No, no, just a, a no, clarification on that point. No, I think, I think the reassurances are very, Councillor very Dyke welcome. Yeah. You've asked your questions. It's now Councillor Blake. I've got three more councillors. You asked a series of questions uh, and you spoke for some time. Thank you. Councillor Blake. Sorry, Councillor Goldberg. I've got cabinet members that I'm going to bring in afterwards. I I, can I pick them up afterwards? I'd rather do it this way. Thank you, Chair. I've got three questions, Chair, um, for Alan. Um, the first one is on the governance of the HDV. Um, will councillors have full access to the minutes of the HDV? Um, the second one is on potential conflicts of interest. I mean, can you confirm that those councillors who sit on the HDV board have their first duty to the HDV or to the council? And my final question is just, um, I, I think it's been asked previously, but again, I think it would be good just to get kind of clarity. Um, can, can you just clarify the issue of whether the council will be free to develop property with other companies apart from Lendlease? Thank you. 
Um, so in terms of um, you know, details of governance like the minutes, um, the honest answer is that that is not something we've, we haven't got to that level of detail yet. That hasn't been discussed. Um, so that is very much to be resolved, but it's a very important question. There will also be a wider discussion in the next five months around how you know, councillors more widely can be, can be properly involved um, with the vehicle um, and with um, regeneration planning um, on an ongoing basis. Um, in terms of um, conflicts of interest, again, we did um, cover this earlier. Um, as I mentioned, um, many councillors, through their membership of the Ali Pali board or different trustee boards they're put on as an appointed member, um, do face the situation where they're both an elected councillor of this, um, this corporate body but are also then bound by um, trustee law and or company law elsewhere. Um, that is an established conflict of interest uh, which members face. And I won't go into the detail because there is, a, there is sort of standard guidance that the legal team um, provides on that. And again, on other properties, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the council can still develop its own properties. We can still work on other pieces of land um, with other, other developers um, and other housing associations. Our initial commitment is only to the um, phase one sites. So, uh, Brapperson. During our research into, the, into development vehicles, we did a lot of research as we could with authorities that had entered into these arrangements, and these company structures are pretty much the same, whether they're in Croydon, Tunbridge Wells, Slough, or elsewhere. I want to ask you, I'll just give you a little quote from a report, a council meeting in Croydon, December 2013, when the Deputy Leader, well, the then leader of the Labour Group, said with relation, in relation to um, these, these deals, he said, this is Councillor Newman, large long-term contracts being entered into without full consideration of risks or proper discussion in relevant committees. He said that there was an admission of a cost of over 140 million on the HQ when previously claimed to be at no cost, not to mention other costs and commitments relating to C-Curve, which you know was their company, emerging whilst the core logic of C-Curve has never delivered. And his colleague, Councillor Davis, said, £150 million on the HQ, £13 million on Davis House, stating that C-Curve has delivered nothing except debt. So my question to you is, what lessons have you learned in your research into this and going into this riskiest ever venture that this council has ever done from the experiences of other authorities, such as Croydon, which was a 450 million uh, project, as you know, which has now been dissolved. Thank you for your question, Councillor Brabazon. Um, so as we've discussed before, um, as part of the Future of Housing Review, um, me and the cross-party panel um, travelled around the country, um, and we went to see cooperative housing trusts, we went to see you know, the council transferred to. We went to see council, labour councils who transferred all their stock to housing associations. We went to see um, a development vehicle. We went to see councils who brought all of their housing back in-house. Um, so we, we really did um, go around the country looking at all of these um, different examples. That did include um, examples um, of development vehicles. And we did have, with those councils, lengthy. So we went to Sunderland for a whole day. We had an entire day with senior managers, the leader, the cabinet members, um, and we had sort of five or six hours of solid questioning of them. Um, so I can reassure you that we did get well into the detail. Um, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, the business case, which looked at six options, which went to cabinet in November 2015, again, was an independent look um, at all of these options. Finally, on the Croydon example um, specifically, um, my understanding of the Croydon example is it was very different. Um, it was a small scheme um, to build some council offices. Um, I, I don't know the details of the, the sort of debt arrangements, but what I would say is um, this is very different to building a council office block. You were building, um, the development vehicle would build, um, business space, homes, um, and hopefully more commercial, more, more uh, business properties that will generate an income. And that's completely different to, to saddling yourself with a building um, and running up a massive debt which you have no prospect um, of paying back. But I also know that the leader of the council rang the leader of Croydon Council um, to ask about this project and um, particularly, and again was reassured by him that there were very, very significant differences um, between these two projects. So um, we do go into this with our eyes open. We have literally travelled around the country um, looking at other examples. Um, as we said earlier, we do accept there are risks, but huge amounts of work is going on around those risks, and that will continue in the next five months.
Uh, no, I'm going to move on, uh, Councillor Brabazon, to Councillor Carter. I've still got a number of contributions to take from Cabinet members uh, this evening. Um, thank you, Chair. My, my earlier question uh, was focusing on the um, asset side of the balance sheet. I'd like to ask a few questions about the liabilities side. I think um, Councillor Berryman touched on this, and others, other councillors have mentioned the question of debt. Um, I, I'm interested in the, in, in the aspect of gearing. I'm sure you appreciate that um, the, the more that is borrowed, um, the higher the potential rates of return and also the higher the risk. Risk is a factor which is uh, uh, exercising an awful lot of counsellors at, at the moment. Um, so what restrictions, if any, are there on borrowing um, one of the reasons that I ask a question like this is that currently we have um, the lowest interest rates for 300 years, the lowest interest rates really ever. This can't really be expected to last indefinitely and certainly not for the 20-year life of this um, joint venture. So um, what restrictions, please, on, on borrowing? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Um, given the question um, leads about the details of borrowing, um, I think it would be good to hear from the Chief Financial Officer to get a response on this. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, we uh, have to abide by the rules of the Prudential Code, which is a code um, which requires us to look at affordability when we are considering how much to borrow. Um, so in every, uh, every annual council, there will be uh, calculations based upon what we can afford, and that's through the Prudential Code. Uh, so the, the code allows us to borrow as much as we need as long as we, uh, as long as we can uh, prove that that's, uh, that is affordable within the amount of income that we have. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that. So I've now got uh, Cabinet members. I've got Councillor Ahmet, Councillor IEC, Councillor Goldberg. Thank you, Chair. So my question's for Councillor Strickland, and it's two-part. Um, the first part of which I think has already been put to you and you've responded, and that was to do with the assurances that our preferred bidder um, shares our values and commitments to trade unions and the vital work they do in the protection of workers. Um, so the second part to my question is, please, can you outline how between now and July um, trade union colleagues will be consulted and engaged in the process? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Councillor Ahmet. So, um, in terms of the trade union process, there were discussions with the unions um, in advance of um, the November 2015 Cabinet report. Um, of course, we haven't um, liaised with the unions in the intervening period because we've simply been doing the, the back and forth um, discussion um, with the bidders. Um, so, what will happen next is um, when we're in a position where we, we're a bit clearer um, what the cheapy position might be, um, officers again will enter um, into um, detailed discussions um, with trade union colleagues. Um, but it is important to say that um, the, the number of posts that may, may have to be chewed, um, you know, is, is very low indeed. Councillor Ayusi. Thank you, Chair. Um, during this meeting, Councillor Strickland, we've heard about assets, governance, risk, partnership, procurement, capital, um, even about debt and kind of various financial parlance. But what we really haven't actually heard is the aspirations of the people that live in the borough. So for me, when I speak to residents on a broad or farm estate, they tell me about actually they want homes for their young, young children to be able to study in. They want homes for their older children who are 27 plus sharing rooms with their 15 year old brothers and sisters to be able to purchase. And while it's right that we actually talk about the process, we should also talk about the outcomes on what, if should we kind of pass the HDV tonight, the wider regeneration um, objectives that HDV will help us to realise. So can you speak to that, especially not only to social housing and affordable housing, but to the, pe the people aspect of regeneration? Yes, thank you very much, Councillor Aisi. Um, and I think you're completely right to say that um, given um, the, the press coverage and all of the misinformation that's been circulated, um, we, we, do get, we do get distracted from, um, as you say, the, the, the real focus um, on residents. So I touched on some of the wider issues earlier um, to come to the specific people um, aspects that you mentioned. Um, 
I think you're quite right to say that on estates like the farm and others, we have to be honest with residents, have to discuss with residents the fact that, you know, normally on a council estate, we would do decent homes, which gets you a new front door, some new windows, a new roof, um, and a new bathroom. And we, ha we have to be honest with residents, as we were in Love Lane, um, that actually on some estates, we don't think a new roof and some new windows is really going to solve the problems that they have raised with us through the consultations, but exactly as you say, councillor, nor um, will it satisfy the huge ambitions and huge aspirations that residents have also raised um, during those consultations on the estate in your ward um, and in others. So um, that involves the homes and jobs which I mentioned earlier, but it also does include um, firm um, commitments that we'll be seeking um, around um, skills, around apprenticeships, um, around um, a new um, GP surgery um, in North Tottenham, um, new community facilities and new community halls um, and other ventures. We'll also, um, through the master planning, be, you know, I know a key issue, for example, in Northumberland Park when I've met residents is they want better quality uh, green space built into the new development, so we'll want to talk to residents about that outdoor space and play space um, and other quality. Um, but equally, um, before Christmas, I met with one of the children's centres in Northumberland Park um, and have um, visited the school previously. I went to the Willow School last week to talk about regeneration. So we continue to engage very heavily um, with the schools um, because it's absolutely vital that they're involved. And, of course, the proposal is, um, subject to further consultation, that um, in Northumberland Park there's an opportunity to build an absolutely fantastic 21st century brand-new school um, through this process. So you're quite right to say that it wouldn't just be about homes, and I think the challenges that you raise from your ward um, around how the farm needs more community facilities, needs those other facilities is, is absolutely right um, and um, I can make a clear commitment to pursuing those things through this process but also a clear commitment that they, we will work very hard with ward councillors um, and residents as I mentioned earlier you know to have that discussion about what people want in areas what they need what their ambitions are and therefore what we should instruct the development vehicle to look at. Councillor Goldberg and then Councillor Arthur. Uh, thank, thank you. My, my first point was just for the record I was conscious I was lately to just confirm I had no conflict of interest and have received no gifts, which was why I wanted to intervene earlier. Uh, just make that clear in case anyone wanted to go back and sort of say, oh, Councillor Goldberg was in the room uh, when that declaration was made. Um, I, I think uh, I just had two other questions, really, which I think uh, are, are slight statements, but also I think lay out why we decided to go with the vehicle. And obviously you yourself, uh, myself, Councillor Arthur, have sat in rooms uh, looking at how we would um, kind of proceed with this development vehicle because it's not just about housing. Uh, but, uh, but I wonder if you could outline how many homes you think might build uh, over the period versus the 1,600 uh, homes that were built across the entire country last year. That's just four for every local authority. And whether you think we'd solve Haringey's housing crisis if we didn't decide to go ahead with the housing development, what would we be doing to the working class people who want to live in London and work in London if we decided to abandon uh, the only means available uh, to actually get homes built that are at target rent, as people have asked this evening? I think the second thing... Um, I'd like to ask again, I point people for the criteria that I think I'm out of public record in the report tonight. Uh, again, they were criteria that were much debated over by officers for a uh, continued amount of time. And again, uh, I think a lot of people decide to focus on uh, housing, and quite rightly so. But they also decide to focus on bricks and mortar. Uh, but you yourself, Councillor, have always talked about the social dividend, and uh, I've pressed you quite hard on that as someone responsible on social inclusion. Uh, and so I think we as a Cabinet are very clear that actually where people live uh, means it's where they live, not just the house, but actually a home, uh, and that there has to be an opportunity to work, there has to be resilience within the community, and there has to be um, eco ecologically sound... Um, ecologically Can I just sound clarify, work? Cabinet members are not required to ask, ask questions. They are having a debate here and a discussion. Councillor Goldberg, will you continue? Uh, ecologically sound. So, so I wonder if you could highlight some of the other things that we think we will achieve uh, that are being outlined in the bid. Uh, in terms of that social, uh, social justice, social inclusion, uh, and some of the ecological measures. I'll take Councillor... Thank you, Brian Haley. Uh, Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Leader. There's been a lot of discussion about the uh, risks of uh, getting involved with the HDV, and that's absolutely right. But what we haven't necessarily focused on as much are the risks of not acting 
Um, one of the clear risks as the finance lead that I can see is the financial sustainability of this council. You look at uh, what we are due to uh, discuss later on in this meeting, we have an overspend projected this financial year of £21 million. We're about to agree a, a five-year financial strategy when government grant is about to be uh, phased out, removed, we are going to be reliant on local sources of income. We're going to be reliant on council tax and business rates. So for me, one of the key risks of not having a, uh, a clear way of delivering uh, significantly more homes and uh, by boosting businesses uh, within this borough, a clear risk of not pursuing this is that the financial sustainability uh, of the council will uh, be jeopardised. So I wanted a, some of your reflections on that, and then B, if there are any additional risks that y you can see uh, us encountering if we aren't going to go forward with this development vehicle. Um, thank you very much for those questions. So, um, Councillor Goldberg, in terms of your um, question on the number of homes, so um, we're expecting a minimum of um, 6,000, but of course as we look at sites in more detail, we'd hope um, that that would very much um, increase. As you say, um, we know that we need thousands of new homes. Um, objective assessment of the need for housing in this borough shows that there is um, a gap that runs to thousands, many thousands. Um, so you're quite right to suggest that um, unless we found some way, whether it was this route, whether it was working just entirely with a developer in a traditional sense or in, you know, giving the land to a housing association, unless there was some clear route of working with a partner, with the money, with the expertise, uh, with the staff and ability to make these things happen, um, then we would continue doing what we're doing now which is the council building a very small number of homes and even that stretching um, our budget um, and working with housing association partners in our own land and which again we're talking about hundreds of homes um, when we need thousands. Um, so I think you're quite right to suggest that um, you know, alternative models um, that people have suggested would mean doing this more slowly, would involve building um, fewer homes, but crucially wouldn't give us any control um, about what happened, um, wouldn't give us um, any share um, of the profits that came forward. And I feel very strongly that we are talking about public land and we do have a very significant responsibility um, to be guardians of that land. Um, and that means, I think, making sure that where public land is used, the public should, the public should expect a clear dividend from that. Um, and the dividend from that, we can reinvest in affordable housing, um, in community facilities um, and other things when the profit um, starts to, to come through. Um, your second um, point on the criteria, um, I absolutely um, agree with, and as Councillor Goldberg emphasised, the, the, the role of politicians in this process was to set the criteria, be clear what we wanted and set the criteria um, at the beginning. Um, and through those discussions and through Councillor Goldberg's leadership on this, um, the criteria, the score um, for socioeconomic regeneration was equal to the scores um, for the other types of regeneration. So it, was, it is not the case, as you said quite rightly, that um, the people aspect of this is a, you know, sort of stuck at the bottom with a few percent. This is a major priority for us. And bidders are bidding to work with us on the basis that we've been very clear that if they are not prepared to embark on health projects and skills projects and apprenticeships, and if they're not prepared to help us build new schools, if they're not prepared to invest in green space, don't come to Herringear. We don't want to work with you. So bidders have um, come to work with us on that basis. Um, finally, on the, um, the green agenda, this again is very important, something I know has been discussed um, significantly. Um, obviously, you've been leading council on the decentralised energy network. Um, which be incredibly helpful um, in powering homes um, involved in this scheme in the, in the Tottenham area um, in particular and potentially in Wood Green um, as that network um, develops. As I said, green space um, and provision of green space and biodiversity has emerged um, as a key theme already in Northumberland Park from consultation with residents. Um, that's something we want to look at. Um, and of course, the work of Councillor uh, Doran um, in looking at sustainable regeneration makes some very clear recommendations um, about how we might want to do that, which we will certainly um, be looking to implement. Uh, Councillor Arthur, in terms of uh, your question, so I think you're quite right that there are you know, I think the, the, the key insight from your points, which is spot on, is that there are significant risks with any course of action open to the council. There isn't a risk-free way to build thousands of homes. Um, and I know that uh, many people have lobbied us hard to say, well, look, why doesn't the council just build all of these homes themselves? I've been honest about why we can't do that. But I think we also have to be honest and say that the council going um, full pelt into property development and the vagary to the property market is the highest risk thing we could possibly do um, in order to bring these plans to fruition. So let's not pretend um, that us becoming a developer um, is somehow a risk-free option. It's not. It's 
incredibly risky. And if that did go wrong, or even if houses sold more slowly or at a slightly lower price than we'd expect, as you say, Councillor Arthur, you would be asked to find money in your budgets to prop up um, falling property prices or stagnating um, property prices. Um, and in terms of the um, financial sustainability, I think you're quite right in terms of, um, you know, new businesses in particular, um, the, the request of the development vehicle to implement um, some of the fantastic recommendations in the growth strategy will bring in significant new council tax, which is absolutely vital to your ability um, as Cabinet Member for Finance uh, with Tracy and others um, to deliver the um, services we need across the borough. Um, the, the second additional benefit I think here is the fact that we do get 50% of the profit from this company. We can therefore as a council choose either to recycle that back into the vehicle, into things like housing, or we might decide actually to recycle that money back into the council itself um, to fund um, investments that you're uh, making. So um, that, that is absolutely vital. And as you say, um, the financial risks around not doing some of these things um, are enormous and it is important to, re to remember those as well. Thank you, uh, Councillor Strickland. I'm struck uh, this evening by uh, one of the comments earlier around the need to provide certainty to tenants, and I think that's absolutely fair and correct. Uh, I think the other people that we need to uh, provide a sense of certainty are the families in this borough who don't have the security of a permanent home, uh, the 3,000 families uh, that we too often see in our councillor surgeries who have uh, very little security, uh, who, face, who face a very difficult future unless councils like our own and councils up and down the country uh, decide to go forward in a different way. Uh, because we're very clear here that last year, uh, just 1,300 council homes were built in the entirety of the country. I'm pleased to say uh, that a decent number of those uh, were, were done here, but we know this is exceptionally challenging. And unless we, if we are not prepared as politicians to adopt a council of despair for those homeless families, uh, then we do, have to, we do have to be bold, we do have to take proportionate risks, uh, we do have to do things uh, differently. Uh, and it's those people that I'd like uh, all of us to think about as we go into uh, the next part of this discussion, which will be agenda item 23. But at this stage, I'm going to uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, back to item 9, the deputation uh, from uh, the group on David Benny, who's the spokesperson of the Friends of the Reading and Education Group. Uh, Mr. Benny, thank you for your patience uh, this evening. Uh, so, as you will know, you have uh, three minutes to address the Cabinet, and I'm then going to ask any Cabinet colleagues to put forward uh, questions to your deputation party for up to five minutes, and then, following all of that, I'll ask the Cabinet Member for Customer Services and Culture to respond to the issues that you raise, and then, finally, we'll go straight on to consideration of the item uh, that you've made uh, your deputation on. So, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Firstly, I note that the recommendation in 14.1 states the recommendation is that the item, the, sa the saving in 2017-18, is removed from the savings proposals. So I'm working on the assumption I don't need to argue for that change. What I do want to do is say, how did we get here in the first place, and how do we avoid getting there in the future? Um, I think that what... I mean, I'm amazed that this proposal was made in the first place because as far as I'm concerned, investment in libraries pays dividends. Cuts in libraries is a false economy. And that these proposals were made because there was no proper consultation in advance. Four had been meeting regularly with the council for years, three or four times a year. We had no meetings with the council for six or nine months and suddenly we discovered this proposal to make cuts. I suspect that these cuts might not have even been proposed in the first place if there had been adequate, adequate communication between councillors and four in the first place. So what I want to do, working on the assumption that we have managed to win the argument to avoid these cuts, is to try to ensure that we move forward productively in the future. Now what that really needs is that the council... As people leaving the public gallery just to be quiet and respectful to uh, the members of the public who have patiently waited to speak about the issue that they feel yeah. passionately about. Yeah. So Mr. what ben. is needed is a meeting between council officers and or councillors, probably both, with four, to look forward to how we can manage things in the future. 
I would also stress that there are issues that we didn't have a chance to raise. For example, my understanding, my own library had no newspapers for three or six months. Um, I understand that many of the branch libraries haven't had functioning printers for many months. If you want to close libraries in the future, you do it by making the libraries less and less attractive to people until you can reach a stage at which you're able to say they're no longer used, we, know we should close a few of them down. So we need to try to ensure that libraries are properly provided for in the future because they actually more than pay for themselves in terms of their contribution to this, this area. I think that's the basics of it, and we can then ask a few questions. Thank you, Mr. Benny. Um, I have to say, there are a few deputations that are as concise as that. You came in 40 seconds early, so um, thank you for that. So, um, any cabinet member uh, questions for uh, the deputation? I, I could just probably say something which is, sounds fairly dull, but uh, in response to your question about newspapers, um, it was much more in the realms of cock-up than conspiracy. Uh, there was earlier in the year, as a result of the, um, some of the, the stops that we put on spending because of the overspend that was emerging, uh, that actually in practice made it very difficult for some of our individual libraries to source the newspapers that they usually bought on an individual basis. So uh, we, we were aware that that problem emerged. We found a way around it, but unfortunately, uh, the, the problem that we had in the meantime was the, that that you described. So. Um, that's what happened there. I'm going to turn to Councillor Vanier, though, to respond to the issues that you've raised. Um, first of all, can I thank you for your deputation? Um, I, I think I must point out the fact that um, those proposals to um, reduce um, the library hours was... Um, <coughs> in an effort to ensure that um, the libraries would remain open. And I'd like to point out that we are one of the few boroughs who have actually been investing in our libraries um, when quite a few um, London councils, um, not just London councils, but nationally, have actually been closing quite a lot of those libraries. So I'd just like to say, rather than... Um, not investing, we have been investing in our libraries and we continue to do so at the moment. For example, at the moment we are um, investing in um, our major libraries uh, to um, increase um, the uh, books that we have there. Um, CDs and so on um, and um, that has been something that we will continue to do it is actually taking place at the moment we're doing quite a bit of investment in Marcus Garvey for example and had done so in the past in terms of having a meeting happy to do that um, I'd like to just thank you for your deputation and um, your comments have been noted Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Bennett. If you'd like to take a seat back, we're going to straight, go straight on to consider uh, the medium-term financial uh, strategy, uh, item 11. So, um, Councillor Arthur. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, so I'll try and be uh, as brief as I can. Um, firstly, setting out uh, why we are where we are. So just to remind the Cabinet that, um, uh, and I'm sure we're all aware of this, a mixture of really rapid uh, increases in demand, particularly for adult social care, children's services and temporary accommodation, combined with uh, significant decreases in our funding and uh, the added pressure of strains across the public sector have meant that despite the fact that we've made about 70% of uh, the savings proposals that we agreed back in 2015, there's about 30%, uh, equates to about £24 million uh, that we believe uh, we cannot make. And looking over the next five uh, years, we think there's a gap of around 45 million. When we last discussed this in January, it was 43 million. And subsequently, uh, after the uh, provisional local government settlement, we think it's gone up to about 45 million. So the challenge that we face is uh, stark. Um, it's worth uh, noting, uh, again, that in terms of the uh, adult social care precept, um, when we agreed the uh, 
proposals to go to consultation back in December uh, and our uh, assumptions around funding and income, we had assumed that the social care precept would be 2% for three financial years. Uh, we now know that we can uh, levy 3% in one financial year, but that it still needs to be 6% across three financial years. Uh, so in terms of what this report will be recommending, it's that we will do 3% uh, social care precept in 2017, 18 and 18, 19, uh, but that we continue to freeze uh, the base rate uh, of council tax, which means that we will uh, continue to deliver on our manifesto commitment, um, but also it's particularly important given that we're seeing uh, growth in the GLA precept of 1.5%, so the extent that we can protect households, uh, it's right that we freeze uh, the base rate. A few uh, final points. Clearly, um, we've talked a lot about risks with regards to the uh, HDV. There are clearly risks involved with the medium-term financial strategy here. Um, you know, being very open about it. If you look at the savings proposals that we're going to be pursuing, about 65% of them are rated as either red or amber in terms of deliverability. And I think we need to be very clear that we are consistently monitoring the delivery of those savings, that we're working with officers, with partners, with residents to change the way in which the council operates so that it's more financially sustainable whilst uh, delivering uh, on our corporate plan. Finally, uh, in terms of the consultation, I thought it was worth just thanking everyone uh, who did get involved and also to thank Scrutiny uh, for their recommendations. In terms of the two key changes that are uh, being recommended in this report, one, as has already been said, is that the uh, library hours saving proposal, the library hours cut, uh, is taken uh, out of the proposals that go to full council uh, and also uh, that we revisit um, how our, our parking service works, that we take away the proposal uh, for having a new target operating model for the parking service, but that we spend a bit more time uh, thinking about what uh, would essentially deliver best value for money and deliver the outcomes that we're looking for in that area. Okay, uh, Councillor Connor now, uh, I'm going to ask to speak to the overview and scrutiny recommendations and then I'll bring in other members who have questions. I've got you noted down, uh, Councillor Engert. Thank you, Chair. Um, that was a very concise summing up from Councillor Arthur about the risks. Um, I'd just like to say that the um, final budget scrutiny recommendations were put together through all the panel's work, um, and then they came together to OSC, Overview and Scrutiny, who looked at those recommendations again and discussed at length, and um, as I'm sure you're aware, and um, we came up with some of the responses. Um, I would just like to sort of... Um, draw the attention, and I know Councillor Arthur's done that, about the risk, the financial risk um, at the moment. And I think as part of scrutiny, we are very aware, and I think one of the cross-cutting issues that we, and recommendations that we put across for all panels was that when we get the information about the budget, we get a much more detailed risk assessment of what the proposals are, because I think, as he's already mentioned, 65% of those savings, uh, potential savings are amber or, and some of them are red. So I think as part of that and also the mitigation around those risks, it would be incredibly helpful for scrutiny to debate that and discuss that in that sort of um, environment. So that would be really helpful. Um, the recommendations that I just wanted to um, bring to your attention, I mean, um, very pleased that the two that you've suggested, especially the libraries, have been um, taken off um, that was one of our key recommendations. The other one that I just wanted to um, mention was the disability-related expenditure. Um, we had a debate in scrutiny that the individual assessments that are going to need to take place to, to go through everyone's individual financial assessment relating to this may actually reduce the savings that are potentially going to be made. So I think not only did we feel uncomfortable as the panel um, putting forward this um, as a proposal, and that's why we actually um, asked that this should not proceed um, because of the, the clientele that it, you know, it relates to and, um, you know, their financial situation. We also would be really mindful that actually we could end up spending as much on that. So I think um, I've seen your response, but I would like 
hopefully if there could be further consideration about that, about the actual financial costs, that would be great. Um, the fees and charges relating to transport day, uh, to day opportunities. Um, again, I was very pleased to note that this is going to be um, pushed back for another year to two, well, 2018-19 um, to review the feedback and further assess the impact. Because again, we noted that one of the big changes that is going on in the borough is around the daycare opportunities and how the transformation plans are currently in progress. And we just felt that this would just be one change too far. Um, so we were hopeful that, although we were very pleased that this has been pushed back, that actually at the end of this um, a further assessment, um, the views of um, the people that are using this and their concerns that they have, actually consideration would be that the, this didn't proceed in a future um, part of the recommendation. And then one last one. No, I think it was just the libraries. So that was, um, and that was it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Connor. Councillor Engert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, four questions, please. Um, uh, on page 184, table 7.4, on page 185, 7.32, um, there is a gap in this budget of 45.6 million, which is due to be bridged by a combination of savings and reserves. Do you think it's sustainable for the Council to choose £22 million worth of reserves in this way, considering that previous savings have not been achieved? Page 188, I'm concerned to see that over half of the savings have been give, given, as you noted and Connor, Councillor Connor did, a red or amber rating, suggesting that many of these cuts are not deliverable. Given the low level of reserves, what will happen if these savings are not made? On page 199, 10.5 and page 918, Point one four, I'm concerned that the Council is proposing borrowing 89.4 million with a revenue cost of 20 million. When the revenue budget is so fragile, do you think this is wise when 45 million of the borrowing over half is due to be spent on the new Council headquarters and civic building? And page 205, 14.1, I'm glad you've listened to the opposition and scrutiny on the proposed library cuts and u turned. Will the six jobs that have been due to be cut now be protected for the life of the five-year medium-term financial strategy? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, in terms of... Uh, use of reserves more broadly uh, linked to risk. So I'm going to combine questions one and two, if that's OK. Um, so look, I think we've got to be uh, uh, very clear about the risks that we face. Some of them are uh, red or amber, not because they are not deliverable, but because uh, more work needs to happen in order to flesh out the proposal. So. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Osborne Grove is a, a good example where we believe we will be able to deliver a saving, but the extent of that saving will depend on uh, what comes out of an options appraisal and what Cabinet decides uh, uh, to uh, pursue. That will then obviously have an impact on our medium-term financial strategy. So it's not so much that it is rag rated as red uh, because it, there is no saving that is achievable or that we think it's unlikely, but that we still need more information, more specifics on it. There are other savings proposals, however, which you know, it will be challenging to deliver. It will require us to work in a new way, particularly with um, other local authorities, I think. I think we need to be clear, though, that you know, officers and I believe cabinet members have been very diligent in thinking through uh, what can be achieved, what's going to be difficult, but the context in which we're in, 40% cuts to our budget uh, and a public sector overall, whether it's uh, the NHS, whether it's housing policy, whether it's welfare policy, which is uh, creating additional burdens for us, 
you know, that context is a challenging one to operate to then be able to give definitive proposals that we know will 100% deliver on these savings. So the reason why this report has been quite transparent is because there is work that we all need to do in order to monitor those risks. The prudence that we have shown in previous years has enabled us to have a strong reserves base, which means that we will be able to mitigate some of those risks uh, that we face now. Absolutely, uh, I think you're right, and I think this is underlying, uh, underpinning rather your question, we cannot rely on our reserves indefinitely. That is clearly a poor uh, financial strategy to take, which is why we've been really clear that we must focus on growth. That's why the HDV conversation that we've just had was so critical. That's why uh, the housing strategy, why the economic growth strategy is so critical, because we have to generate more from council tax, more from business rates in order to be more financially sustainable. And I believe that the uh, proposals here uh, are not just about cuts, but also about some of the things that we're going to invest in, particularly on the capital side, that if we are able to deliver on this uh, MTFS, that we will be in a much uh, better position to be financially sustainable. Um, in terms of uh, borrowing, and uh, it sounded like actually that question was to take a, a dig at uh, the plans for a new he corporate headquarters, so let me just jump straight to that. We have to be uh, clear that the council in terms of size is shrinking. We need to be utilising space uh, better the way in which we're utilising the Civic Centre and the offices in Station Road uh, is not efficient. And we also want to be releasing uh, this location and Station Road in order to be able to generate more homes and uh, retail space for jobs. So in terms of borrowing in order to invest in new headquarters, I think we're going to uh, get much more back in terms of having facilities that enable the council to be more agile, flexible, efficient, and also releasing land, which is going to support the growth that we need in order to be able to be financially sustainable and deliver the services that our residents uh, want, need, expect. In terms of, uh, finally, your question around jobs, it's not my place as the Cabinet Member for Finance to at this point say what the staffing structure will be like uh, for uh, library service. However, there is a clear commitment that we are going to not only keep all of our libraries open, not only uh, maintain the library hours as they are, and I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a U-turn. We go into uh, uh, finance consultations, budget consultations with proposals that we want to get feedback on to decide what we should do. Um, you know, we are clear that we are going to be investing uh, significantly in our libraries, that they're going to remain open, that we're going to protect their hours, and as you'll have seen from the uh, budget papers, that we'll be investing a further £2 million into uh, our libraries in the next financial year, including Hornsey Library, which will get a significant refurbishment, uh, of refurbishment of uh, Wood Green Library and also significant IT expenditure across all of our libraries, both community and the major ones as well. Uh, Councillor Engel, if it's quick. I just wanted to guarantee the hours wouldn't be cut over the medium term financial strategy. That's all. That, that it's for, um, it, it lasts, that commitment to keep the hours. You have that commitment. I guess if we see a Liberal Democrat victory in 2018, Gail, everything could be different. <laughs> you could U-turn on your U-turn. Um, but we'll leave it there. Right. Um, Cabinet, uh, we're being asked to look at the recommendations at section 3.1 to 3.123 and propose that the budget report proceed to full council for approval. Is that agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Fees and charges, item 12, Councillor Arthur. Yep, this is a straightforward report. Um, I won't go into much detail, but essentially suggests increases for most charges of around about 1.7 to 2%. There are some fees which go higher than that. That's either to ensure that we're basically following uh, benchmarks for those services with other London local authorities, uh, or because it makes sense for it to be beyond 2% for rounding and ease of collection. Okay, um, so there's a 
bundle of recommendations uh, in the bullet points at section 3.1. Uh, there's also a series of equalities impacts as, uh, assessments in your bundle, in the second bundle of papers that you have before you. Uh, can I ask uh, Cabinet to uh, agree the recommendations set out in the report? Thank you. Uh, item 13 is the implementation of the National Early Years Funding Formula. Councillor Weston. Thank you, Chair. Um, unlike the previous report, this isn't necessarily straightforward. This report seeks permission to implement the government's new early years national funding formula, which reflects the government's commitment to introduce 30 hours of free childcare for three and four year old children of working parents. Um, you will have seen from the report that these proposals have been developed following significant consultation to a very, very challenging timetable. The government's um, proposals were first announced for consultation in mid-August and they are expected to be implemented from April this year. So it has been challenging and I would pay tribute to the work of officers and everybody that's paid into and fed into the consultation process because it has been difficult but it has also been extremely constructive and I think that's reflected in the proposals in this report. The changes are significant. Um, and there has been extensive work with providers from across the early years sector. You'll see from the report that there is also a clear commitment to continue that work in consultation and to reconsult before next year when the formula will adjust again slightly. Um, we've also identified some further work to be done in North Tottenham and we hope to work with providers and the community there to make sure that the provision for childcare and early years learning in North Tottenham better meets the needs of the community. So on that basis, I please ask colleagues to agree to the recommendations in section three of the report. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Weston. Councillor Brabazon, you haven't got a, re a question. Can I just echo then, Councillor Weston, uh, the words that you said about the uh, early, uh, early help, early years team in the council who have done a huge amount of work, and I know they're here this evening and they've been here for a good couple of hours, but thank you for everything that you've done on this. It's been uh, really fantastic in the most trying of circumstances. I think uh, we're doing the best we possibly can. Uh, can I ask Cabinet to, as Councillor Weston said, look at the recommendations at paragraph three and agree those recommendations? Thank you very much. Uh, item 14 is the budget monitoring quarter three report. Budget monitoring quarter three report. Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Leader. So, what the report uh, outlines for noting is that there's been uh, a small improvement um, in the uh, four-year deficit projection. So, from 22 million pounds to 21.3 million pounds. Clearly, the three areas that I referred to earlier adults, children's and temporary accommodation are the three areas that we're still grappling with. Uh, there's still a bit of work that needs to be done in terms of forecasting, just to make sure that we are forecasting accurately for year end, because having spoken to the Section 151 officer, I think there's still potentially a few areas where we need to be 100% sure that we are going to spend what we think we are going to spend at the moment. Um, but beyond that, uh, some of the things that I've outlined in the past in terms of the corporate restrictions on spending and additional work that's happening to support transformation work is critical. I'm just going to bring in the Section 151 officer just to say a word on reserves, assuming that the overspend doesn't fall significantly by the end of the year. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the position with the reserves is that um, we have a number of what's called earmarked and non-earmarked reserves. Earmarked reserves are those reserves that are earmarked for specific things. Non-earmarked reserves are those that uh, we kind of hold for rainy day and is, that, is the thing that people look at as the amount of money that we have for our sustainability. Um, what I've had to do in order to manage and mitigate the risk on the, uh, on the overspend of 25, 21 million coming true is I've had to consolidate some of our earmarked reserves um, and to get, have a really close look at whether or not those reserves have been committed or not. Um, and have therefore consolidated some of those earmarked reserves to give us enough um, uh, leeway in order to cover the uh, overspend position at the end of the year. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm looking around the room, don't see any questions. So, uh, can I ask Cabinet to agree the recommendations set out section three? Thank you. Uh, item 15, General Practitioners Services Framework for Prevention Services, Councillor Arthur. Uh, thank you, Leader. So, uh, given the scale of things we've discussed today, this is the type of report that I think can get lost. 
but actually is really, uh, really important. Um, so if you look at the, some of the challenges that we face uh, and what ultimately lead to some of the social care costs that we see, which are significant, be it smoking, be it um, uh, cardiovascular disease, which uh, I believe I'm looking at the Director for Public Health just to make sure I'm right in saying this, but that we have some of the worst levels, if not the worst level for mortality from CVD in the country. Um, it's critical that we're utilizing primary care to deliver uh, prevention services in an effective way. So what this report does is it uh, essentially commissions GPs for an estimated cost of about 1.2 million to provide uh, prevention services that support uh, broader health care, um, sexual health, smoking cessation, etc. Okay. Any questions at all? No? Okay. So, agree the recommendations, Cabinet? Thank you. Uh, item 16 is the update on the statement of community involvement. Councillor Strickland. Uh, thank you, Leader. So we consult on amended version to take into account the um, changes to neighbourhood planning and um, pre-app consultation for developers um, and our desire to move away from sending 160,000 letters a year um, and use more efficient um, electronic means. Um, that's been consulted on and this is to adopt the finished policy. No questions at all. Is that agreed, the recommendation set out in the report? Thank you. Item 17, minor variations to land transactions at Tottenham Hale. Councillor Strickland. Um, thank you, Leaders. So the Cabinet has previously agreed um, two land disposals, which are set out here. Um, detailed design work has shown that we need to, um, in one case, give it a little bit of extra land to make that development work. In the other case, um, the land doesn't change, but we just want to swap it around. So they're just minor amendments given further design work. Is that agreed? It's paragraphs A to C at section 3.1. Thank you. Um, item 18, just to flag that there is exempt uh, information relating to this item, which is item 24. But, Councillor de Mercy, can I ask you to introduce the report on insurance arrangements for leaseholder right to buy properties? Uh, Chair, as you said, uh, this is insurance for the leaseholder and um, right to buy properties. Um, uh, we've, uh, can I firstly thank the officers for the hard work and uh, we've uh, consulted um, twice on this with, with the leaseholders. Uh, we've had the responses back um, and as a result of the, 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 the consultation and the procurement process, the, the recommendations have been put to the Cabinet, which I um, hope that colleagues will agree to, to move forward. Thank you. I don't see any questions in this open part of the agenda, so we'll return to the recommendations in the private session of the meeting. Uh, the minutes of other bodies are here for noting. They're at item 19. Uh, significant and delegated actions, again, for noting at item 20. We don't have any new items of urgent business. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, can we move uh, that uh, the press and public be excluded for the remainder of the meeting as the items uh, below contain exempt information as defined under paragraph 3 and 5 Part 1, Section 12A of the Local Government Act 1972. Chair, before, before we turn, Aisha, can you just go, before we turn the camera off, this is Nick's last meeting, Cabinet meeting. Can I just say publicly, can I thank him for all the service that he's given us? So, um, so thank you very much, Nick, and all the best in your new job. Thank you very much. Well remembered. I'm sure he'll thank you for thanking him later. He, he, looks, he looks absolutely thrilled. Um, if we could tell